Yes, we are ready. Well, good morning, everyone. Hope everyone is well today. Um, thank you for joining us. We will um, had we have a link for all of our meeting materials in our chat. Thank you, Shay. And a few housekeeping. Um, just remember, please keep your camera on if possible. Um, also, uh, make sure your microphone is muted while um, someone else is speaking, unless you want to speak, just to make sure that there's no outside noise. Um, we do have four members that will not be present with us today. Uh, Steven Peterson, Ben Bolin, Chase, our student representative, and Arnold Trejo will be absent today. So as I call your name, if you would please respond so that we can have it for the minutes, I would appreciate that. Uh, Ed Caressley. Okay. Um, Jackie Adler. Present. Tevian Sides. I saw her earlier. I'm sorry, I'm here. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, Joseph Ruiz. Present. Millette Leaf Green. Here. Cecilia Jones. I think Cecilia is at a conference this week, so I don't know if she will be able to join us. Thomas Ratliff. Victoria Chin. Present. Rochelle Garrett. Here. Joy Thomas. Bridget Ingram. Here. Didi Gonzalez, I think, was going to be late this morning. Uh, Holly Nolan. Here. Uh, Shauna Norton. Here. Sal Ramirez. Here. Robert Marino. Present. And Deshae Reed. Present. Was Gilbert Zavala? I'm on. Okay. Did I miss my name? I'm sorry. Yes. Sorry. I missed, I missed it. Thank you, Deshay. I just wrote, I just went right down my list and just slap skipped you, Gilbert. Sorry about that. No problem. I, I, think Jesus is actually here. I thought I might have missed it. I think our okay. student rep is here. Say that again, Deshay. I think uh, our student rep is here as well. Oh, she awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Chase, for joining us. Okay. So um, the first action uh, item we have today is the consideration of approval of our minutes. Uh, that's in our meeting packet. Also, it was sent to you earlier. Are there any questions concerning our minutes from the meeting held on March 3rd? Okay, hearing none, uh, the, the we will uh, the mean the minutes will be approved. Okay, um, the update on prior business. I will turn over to Deshay. Good morning again, everybody. Um, our last meeting back in March, there was one prior business item that had uh, come up. And that particular item was trying to address college student budgets. And the question that was posed during that time, if there is a potential delay in tuition and fees from schools, is there some flexibility with the deadline or the process of modifying uh, the tuition cost? And so I was able to get a response to that particular question. And the agency, we do encourage, you know, as much as possible for the schools to be able to meet the April 1st deadline and hopefully those school um, are able to do so. Your board, members, if they need to meet earlier, that would be recommended. But in the event that you're unable to get the information that you need, we still ask that you provide the college student budget as um, you know of that day. 
by the deadline date. And if you need to change them later, you can do so. Um, and you can make that request through Ken Pond, who is actually a person at our agency who oversees those college student budgets. He will work with those schools to recertify those uh, college student budgets at that time. So again, we still encourage the deadline date of April 1st, but if there's any changes that need to be made after April 1st, that is allowable. And you'll just want to make sure to contact Ken Pond um, and that information um, will be able to provide um, at a later date, but it's also in an announcement that hopefully you all are receiving as it relates to the college student budgets. So that was what was offered and hopefully that helps out some of you who may uh, determine that later those changes need to be made. Any questions or comments um, regarding that item? I do have one comment to say that's in the chat, and I do want to remind you all that the chat is not part of our recorded session. So if you would uh, make your comments uh, out loud so everyone can hear, and uh, the there was a chat that uh, Ken Pond is awesome, and I concur, and we uh, thank him for all of his help. So thank you, Joseph, for bringing that to our attention. Okay, are we ready to move on to our presentations? We have several presentations today. Our first presentation is building a strong, building a talent strong Texas. And our presenter this morning will be Melissa Henderson, Associate Commissioner, Strategic Partnerships and Executive Director for the uh, Higher Education Foundation. Uh, Melissa, are you with us? I sure am, good morning everyone. Okay, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, we look forward to your presentation. Wonderful. Give me one moment to get my slides up and running. Let's see here. Slide. There we go. Can everyone see the slides okay? Yes. Wonderful. And I can only see one of you now that I'm presenting, so uh, it's helpful to, to have a verbal affirmation. So thank you. So good morning, everyone. I'm Melissa Henderson, Associate Commissioner for Strategic Partnerships with the Coordinating Board. I also serve as the Executive Director for the Texas Higher Education Foundation, which is the official nonprofit partner to the agency. So as, as was mentioned, uh, the board adopted in January a revised statewide strategic plan called Building a Talent Strong Texas, which I'm excited to share with you today. So starting from um, in 2020, the coordinating board and the foundation launched a joint effort to revise the statewide strategic plan, which of course, as you know, had been known as 60 by 30 Texas. And we really wanted to ground this work in stakeholder engagement and in what we were hearing from the field. So uh, as part of that stakeholder engagement work, we held 10 listening sessions, virtual, virtual regional listening sessions across the state. Each of those was held in partnership with a university and a community college in that region. And then there was a 10th session that was held in partnership with our chambers of commerce. Uh, and across those sessions, we engaged over 500 stakeholders representing, as you can see here, higher education, K-12, uh, business and industry, nonprofit organizations, and policymakers across the state. And we also engaged with, in one-on-one -on -one, uh, with presidents and chancellors, with thought leaders from across the state and across the nation around some key areas that we were looking into as we revised the goals. So this is the new uh, framework for building a talent strong Texas, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about each of these, but the, the, the primary pillars of the plan are around attainment of post-secondary credentials, and we'll talk about the ways in which those goals uh, have shifted, a new area around credentials of value, a new area around research development and innovation, and then across these, making sure that we're keeping equity front and center and that we're disaggregating the data that we're tracking by race, gender, and income. And then just an acknowledgement that we know this work happens in collaboration and the only way we meet our goals is in collaboration across our public and private partners with input from education, institutional leaders, policymakers, employers, and students. 
But within attainment of post-secondary credentials, attainment of post-secondary credentials is not a new area in and of itself, as you know, but the two primary ways in which this area um, shifted is one, we knew that we wanted to have a more intentional focus on working age Texans. So previously with the 60 by 30 plan, that goal was 60% of Texans age 25 to 34 with a degree or certificate. We've added a goal for 60% of Texans age 35 to 64 with a degree certificate or other post-secondary credential of value. And I'll talk about the addition of that uh, post-secondary credential of value language in a moment. But what we heard from our stakeholders, we knew going into this that we wanted to have a more intentional focus on working age Texans. And what we heard from our stakeholders across the state was that we didn't want to lose focus on that critical 25 to 34 year old young Texan population. At the same time, we wanted to add a focus on those working age adults, which is why you see the two separate goals. And then the second place is again, that add, that addition of the language, other post-secondary credential of value. And here, you know, we wanna continue to track degrees and certificates, but we also wanna widen the lens on the types of credentials that we're counting. And we wanna do that in the context of value. And I'll talk a little bit more about credentials of value on the next slide, but we wanna make sure that we're capturing types of credentials that we may not have captured in the past. So whether that be, you know, continuing executive education, stackable micro credentials. There are a lot of credentials that are being awarded today by our institutions that have demonstrated value in the labor market that just haven't been a part of the data that we've been collecting. So that will be an area that will continue to evolve moving forward as we continue to think about how best to, um, to, to focus on credentials of value. So then within post-secondary credentials of value itself, you'll see, and some of this will look familiar. So again, uh, this is where um, we are focusing on the, the native production within Texas. So the completion of credentials in Texas, the attainment goal, I should have said, is a, is a snapshot in time of the attainment within the population. So that may be degrees, certificates, and post-secondary credentials that have been attained in Texas or individuals moving to Texas who hold those credentials. This is really a focus on our institutions within Texas. So uh, you know, 550,000 students completing post-secondary credentials of value each year. The number is the same as it was under the prior goal, but of course the addition of the credentials of value language is new. And the, the focus there is credentials of value being those for which a student uh, is, is seeing a net positive return within 10 years relative to typ the typical earnings for a high school graduate. So essentially, are you better off for having receive this credential by way of earnings than you would have been had you not attained that credential. And, and we're, we're going to be releasing data dashboards later this year that, that um, demonstrate more of how that is uh, demonstrated across institutions and across programs. But that, that's the high level goal is 550,000 students completing post-secondary credentials of value. And then the second area, there was a debt goal previously focused on first year earnings. And what we wanted to focus on is no or manageable debt. So the, the new goal here is 95% of graduates with either no undergraduate student debt or manageable levels of debt in relation to their potential earnings. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we were focusing on those students. So right, right now, just north of half, around 56% of our students are graduating with no undergraduate student debt. And then we have and then manageable student debt being that which an individual could reasonably pay off within 10 years, again, given typical earnings for the credential that they have earned. So this is a, a shift in the way that we're thinking about debt as well. And then finally, we know that research development and innovation uh, plays a key role in a knowledge economy, and we wanted to reintroduce goals around research and development into the plan. So the two measures here are increasing annual private and federal research and development expenditures by 2030 by a billion dollars from where we are today, and increasing to 7,500 research doctorates awarded annually within Texas. So focusing on both our uh, the, the expenditures of our research programs and particularly those competitive private and federal research dollars and our research doctorates. And again, across all of this, making sure that we're keeping equity front and center. We know that Texas grew more than any other state in the last decade, and that 95% of that growth was in communities of color. So if we're not advancing our goals equitably, then we're not able to meet our goals. So we do wanna make sure that as we roll out data 
and indicators for the new revised plan that we're disaggregating that data by race, gender, income, and geographic area so that we are keeping equity front and center in these discussions. So with that, there we go. With that, I will pause. I know that was a lot of information and I'm happy to take any questions. Gilbert. Yes, thank you, uh, Melissa. Just a quick question related to the, the tracking of progress towards the goal. Are, is the idea that the, the dashboard that you, are, you all are working on would track that progress in real time, or are you projecting that you would do like a semi-annual annual report on, on where we are in relation to the target? Great question. Thank you, Gilbert. So I think, you know, the, da the data we have is the data we have, right? Uh, we want to continue to evolve that over time, but there's, you know, we're only going to have enrollment data or completion data or even UI wage data on a certain cadence based on when it's available. So it will be more timely than I think it has been in the past, uh, but in terms of real-time data, that that's going to depend on the cadence of data submission that we have available. And will it include the, the national enrollment data or only in-state? So right now, you know, as you know, we 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 have state data. We also have national student clearinghouse data, which gives us some information about out of state enrollment. We're very we're very much looking at and working on ways that we can incorporate that national student clearinghouse data as well. Um, and wanting, make, wanting to make sure that we get it right with the state data first and then making sure that that as quickly as is possible that we're also incorporating that NSE data too. So that we're giving as complete of a picture with regard to outcomes as we possibly can. Got it. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Gilbert. Other questions, reflections? Thank you so much, Melissa, for your time this morning and that great information. We appreciate all the work that you guys are doing for us. Thank you all. Have a wonderful day. You too. Thank you. Our next pres uh, presentation is from Laura Brennan, Assistant Commissioner for College and Career Advising. Um, yes. Laura, are you with us? Yes, I am. Good morning. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Okay, are y'all able to see those? Yes. Wonderful. So thank you so much for um, having me here today to share some information about our advising strategy at the agency. Um, and so again, I'm Laura Brennan. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for College and Career Advising. This presentation is going to have a lot of information, so I hope and encourage um, you to interrupt me. You don't even need to raise your hand. You can just chime in or you could raise your hand, whatever you like, but I'd, I'd love to hear from you along the way if you have any thoughts or questions. Okay, so um, one thing to note is that uh, my division, uh, the Division of College and Career Advising, is new for the agency. And so there's a really strategic focus on what you see on this, on this uh, slide right now, that all Texans receive holistic and equitable advising that propels them to obtain credentials of value. So as we saw from Melissa's presentation, we are not going to achieve those goals unless we're supporting advising um, at a really strategic uh, level across the state. And so that's what we're focused on. And I'm gonna share a bit about some of the initiatives that we currently have, and then initiatives that are coming up. So what we have now and, and what I'll focus on um, for this conversation a lot is the Texas OnCourse Academy. So this is online competency-based training for counselors and advisors. And I'll give you a little bit of background around Texas OnCourse. Then I'll also talk about um, some other initiatives that we have in the pipeline that you may or may not have heard of. Uh, My Texas Future is one, and then Map My Path 
is another tool. OK, so before we get into the Texas OnCourse Academy, I just want to share a little bit of information on who Texas OnCourse is. So Texas OnCourse was formed in 2015 after the state really recognized a need for supporting counselors and advisors, specifically in K-12 schools, um, schools and districts. This was after, you know, there had been the new requirement for students to select endorsements in middle school. So if you're familiar with that, it's almost like a meta major that kids were required to select when they're in eighth grade before moving into high school. There was a lot of confusion from all parties on that. And so the legislature was just really interested in providing support to the counselors, but also the students and parents directly um, who are involved in, in that decision making. So that was how we were formed. And we actually used to be housed at UT Austin. So though we were a statewide initiative serving students, not just in UT Austin, we were housed in UT Austin. We've recently in 2021 moved our operations from UT Austin to the coordinating board. I think this was a really great and strategic move because one, we don't have to continue to answer the questions of no, we're not just for UT Austin students. We are actually for the state of Texas. And it gives us the opportunity to really scale strategically and actually better serve um, the advisors on your campuses, not just K-12. So Texas OnCourse, started really with close collaboration um, across educators and employers and state agencies. So we had over 2,500 educators um, help build Texas OnCourse. Oops. And we also worked with uh, employers across the state as well. So the core offerings, and as I mentioned, going back to the real need for Texas OnCourse, was to support those counselors and advisors and then support those students and their families that had to make those decisions as early as middle school about what they're uh, about their future. So um, we have this professional development for educators and then we have college and career exploration tools for students and families beginning in middle school. So I'm going to jump into the academy. And so this is relevant to you because we've actually expanded the academy to serve counselors and advisors beyond just uh, K-12, but also in higher ed. So the academy is a completely free resource. You could go on TexasOnCourse.org today and click this button and register and log in, and you would be able to access this dashboard that you see on my screen right now. There is a very comprehensive list of modules that an individual can enroll in, and uh, it's on-demand, competency-based. So competency-based, um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this, but just uh, in case you're not, it allows an educator to um, recognize, or the system recognizes previous learning from the educator so that they can really focus on where they need to focus um, in their learning. So, you know, if you're an expert on financial aid, but you need a little bit more information on, um, let's say the TASFA, it would help you to focus specifically on the TASFA versus like the FAFSA application. It's also available on your phone. So we try and make it as easy as possible for educators, advisors, anyone who's interested to access the content. And I'm going to share, here is a list of the, the modules. So if you see in the bottom right-hand corner, Success in Higher Education, these modules were actually developed specifically for higher ed advisors. So if you have higher ed advisors at your school um, or, or your financial aid advisors, I think this would be a great opportunity for professional development for them that is completely free, um, that they can access at any time that works for their schedule. So again, you can direct them to texasoncourse.org, or we're happy to do um, some more coordinated presentations within, within your institution to, to really build awareness of um, this resource that uh, is for you. So there are several other modules that our K-12 educators have primarily been enrolled in, but I do think they're relevant across um, both K-12 and higher education. So you can take a look at this, and I know you have this 
uh, in the materials that have been provided to you, but these are all of the modules that we have in the academy. So there's a um, significant amount of information. I will say we're most, we are, um, from my awareness, the most comprehensive online learning opportunity specifically focused on college and career advising. So you may know that there's some modules uh, through INCAN and some other um, national organizations, but they're not specific to Texas and they're not as comprehensive as the resources we have here. Again, completely free, available for you on demand to access. So We've been, uh, you know, it's great to have all this information, but we're consistently looking into, okay, well, what is this doing for the real outcomes we want to drive, which is is um, our, our student outcomes. So first we've looked at uh, how completing the modules is associated with co um, the counselor and advisor knowledge. And what we found is that completing all of the Texas on course modules is associated with the same growth of knowledge as 11 to 30 years of experience for a counselor and advisor. So we're seeing a tremendous growth in counselor knowledge just by completing these online modules. Additionally, we are um, getting reports from, from participating counselors and advisors that their confidence in their knowledge doubles. So if they're feeling more confident in their knowledge, you know, they're able to better support students and families when they come into their office. One common, um, one common example that we hear all the time is that a counselor, and this is in K-12, but you can imagine it happening in higher ed as well. A counselor has an individual, a student come into their office. They ask a question about something that maybe the counselor had never helped with before. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of information that counselors are supposed to hold in their head, like perhaps NCAA is something that the counselor never helped a student with before. Previous to Texas On Course, they would have to go to Google. They would be validating resources to see if they're accurate, um, up to date, and they would spend hours and hours trying to find the right information for that to provide to that student. They probably wouldn't be able to meet with that student the same day. They'd have to meet with them later so that they could compile all the resources. Now, with the academy, that counselor can log into the academy, complete a one-hour module on NCAA, and have pre um, pre-made handouts uh, in both English and Spanish to, um, to hand out to the student and their families, and they can feel confident that the information they have is up to date and accurate. So that's just an example of how the Academy can serve uh, counselors, and I hope that you can help spread the word in higher ed about the Academy, because honestly, we've had a very strong presence in K-12, and we have not had as strong of a presence in higher ed, and I think that's just because of how Texas On Course started um, and where our efforts really began, and now we're really moving into being able to serve the higher ed community um, but we'll need your help in, in really spreading the word. Additionally, um, as I mentioned, you know, this is an extremely comprehensive resource and that's been recognized nationally. We actually have one more state now that is uh, licensing. Idaho is also licensing the Texas on, Court, Texas on Course Academy for their counselors. So we have um, basically agreements with Delaware, Michigan, and Idaho to take the Texas On Course Academy and provide it to their counselors and advisors because they recognize that there's not another resource out there like that to serve, to serve their educators and advisors. So that is the Academy. I'd love to pause and answer any questions you may have on the Academy before we jump into a, a different resource, which is called Map My Path. Any thoughts or questions about the Academy? I have, Go ahead, John. I don't have any questions per se. I just want to say that as a K-12 representative, we've been using Texas On Course for several years now in our middle school campuses and our counselors. I've been having them do some of the professional development pieces and our, your, our knowledge has expanded immensely and it has definitely helped with seventh and eighth graders trying to start thinking about their career paths. And um, we, we, we love Texas on course. So thank you. <laughs> well, thanks. I love that shout out. Thank you. 
and I was just going to ask, how many do you know? How many have actually used the the higher ed modules? Like, what what is the data? Yeah, on? so I can get you the breakdown. I know that um, across the Texas On Course Academy, our registration is around eighteen thousand. So 18,000 users across the state of Texas um, are accessing the modules in the academy. I will say the lion's share is uh, K-12. K-12. So we really need to, um, and, and we're thinking about ways that we can strategically focus on getting more embedded within the higher ed community. Um, so would love, you know, your uh, partnership on that in whatever way you see fit, but, um, I, I feel strongly that these modules are are very helpful for the higher ed advisors as well. And we have modules specifically targeted for higher ed. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments before I move on to a, a different tool that is coming soon? One quick question on, on utilization. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing, um, patterns that you know in terms of regions are you seeing more uptake in some than others and are you able to share uh that so that if there's gaps in our region and among our partners we can spread the word and, and hopefully improve uptake yes i can absolutely share that gilbert we do have an analysis of that i don't um i can't say offhand like which regions are um um less engaged but I will say that, you know, across the K-12, we've had extremely high coverage. Um, so there's there's really no region that is not that is um, not using. Uh, we have over I mean, I think we are at like 98 percent of the districts um, are using the academy. So. We're, we're really covering the majority of K-12 engagement rates. That's where you'd probably be interested to see um, where certain regions are more engaged with than others. Um, and then in higher ed, you know, I, I'd be happy to pull that analysis to see um, where we do have uh, more participation or less. But yeah, we can follow up with that information. Thank you, Laura. That'd be great. Okay. Uh, Laura, this is Robert Marino. I'm president of Task Fund. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, the information that you're presenting here and uh, other information that we get from state, regional, uh, and national associations, along with the point of training. And uh, as, as administrators, we get you know this information from other entities, and I'm trying to figure out how we can in, in integrate it with our regular training. Because at some point it's going to become information overload, um, mm -hmm. and trying to figure out which you know training will be the best uh, as, an, as, a, as an administrator for which one will be the best for my employees. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll reach out to you separately to see how you we can, task I can partner with you and uh, uh, see how we can integrate it uh, and, and start competing with each other. I would love that. Yeah. That sounds great. Okay, so moving on to a resource that is coming soon. Um, some of you may be aware of this, but this is a tool uh, that we will release in, in the new year called Map My Path. So Map My Path is essentially um, designed to solve the problem of students not understanding how their credits transfer and apply across different institutions or across different programs within the same institution. I think we're all aware that, you know, if you're a dual credit student and you are, um, you are thinking about a business degree and you are contemplating whether or not you want to take psychology as your dual credit course or economics. Well, if you took economics, it likely would count and apply um, towards your business degree in most uh, in most colleges and institute in universities. If you took the psychology, it may not. So right now, there's no real clear way for a student or even a counselor um, to get that information in one place. They have to go to the individual institutions, websites, and then the individual college within the institution to see how their credits will transfer and apply. So 
Map My Path will bring this together for the student. So we're taking the recommended course sequences that all of your institutions provided to the agency and using that as the backend database to this tool that will allow students to search for their programs of interest and then enter the courses that they maybe have already taken or are contemplating taking and see how they transfer and apply to different programs. So in you, you see this um, example on the screen right now, it's a little snapshot of what the tool may look like where on the left hand side it says your completed courses so that's where a student would enter their courses and then on the right hand side they're able to compare okay if i am pursuing this accounting degree at um, ut austin or at rgv here's how these credits may apply differently at those different uh, colleges or institutions and so this is not um this is this is really aimed to equip the student with better information quickly and then to connect with an advisor. This is not a, a official audit, right? This is just aiming to get them better information that they have than they have right now and then connect them to, you know, an advisor at the institution to be able to make sure that this is um, this is accurate within each institution. But this has been a big pain point for students and then also K-12 educators alike because the, there's so much uh, variation across the institutions um, and it, it's very difficult to navigate. So this, again, like I said, we're in the process of developing. We, we have, you're looking at right now a wireframe of what it really will look like and we will plan to release in early 2023. So if you're interested in being a partner in this, I would love to also connect um, perhaps after this meeting to make sure that your institution is represented in this early launch of the tool um, so that students attending your institution understand how their, how their credits will transfer and apply. And I, I think this is obviously really related to financial aid as you do not want students to accumulate a huge amount of credits that aren't um, that aren't able to apply to their degree program, which may um, at some point uh, remove the opportunity of financial aid. So I think this is really a, a great um, connection point for this group specifically. So please do let me know if you would like to connect after this um, to discuss being a part of the early release. Laura, I have, yes. I, can I make a comment real quick? Mm -hmm. um, later on in our meeting today, we're going to uh, talk about some roadblocks in uh, recruiting and, and retention. And I, I'd like to the committee to just keep this in the back of your mind uh, of how this tool could be useful in that area. Thank you. Great. And I'm happy to, this is a very um, a shallow dive on Map My Path. I'm happy to provide a deeper dive uh, to anyone if they're interested. Um, just let me know. Okay. And then another tool that is coming soon is My Texas Future. So I think, Denise, your, um, the lens that you just brought, keep it in mind for this one as well. Um, so My Texas Future is really seeking to engage, uh, re-engage the adult, potential adult population to re-enroll um, and attain credentials of value within your institutions. So we have been working with um, some partners, some institutional partners to really define what this could look like, but the goal is to really support those adults who have um, maybe stopped out or perhaps they're veterans and they're seeking to engage with higher education after their service, or maybe they're parents and they um, have delayed their education. This is a resource to get them back connected to higher education and see the value and ultimately connect with individuals at your institution. So the goal is that there would be a warm handoff between this My Texas Future portal 
where an individual would create an account and start to um, explore areas of interest in careers and then connect that to the opportunities perhaps in their region or whatever other um, consideration they have in selecting an institution. And then once they indicate interest in perhaps your institution within the My Texas Future portal, we want to directly connect them to your advisors so that your advisors know that there are students that are considering your institution. Um, and so this is, uh, we are expecting a launch in September, which is right around the corner uh, for My Texas Future and would love any partnership um, with your institutions as well in this upcoming tool. The future state of My Texas Future, future of My Texas Future, is to serve K-12 uh, students as well. So right now we've really focused the initial launch on adults because we know that they have a unique set of needs and we didn't wanna release something that was just supposed to broadly serve a K-12 student and an adult student. That doesn't make sense. We need to make sure that we're um, really listening to the needs of those user groups. But we are we are planning to expand to serve the younger audience group in the um, coming year. So we will be able to uh, leverage student data, as you see in this slide, and then really target interventions towards students um, based on the information that they provide. So it'll give us an opportunity. So My Texas Future for K-12 will eventually allow students to log in and start building a portfolio over time of their information, perhaps including test scores. And then it will give us as the state agency an opportunity to identify maybe a student um, performed really well on the PSAT. And we have that score within the My Texas Future portal we could target specific resources to that student, um, like Senate Bill 1888, which allows them to graduate early um, and take that money with them to their institution of higher ed. Previous to rolling out something like My Texas Future that helps us to connect that data early, we are relying on pipelining that information through school districts and counselors. But now we'll have a much more um, uh, strategic and targeted approach to identify students early and, and connect them to the programs that will serve them. Any thoughts or questions on this work? Laura, I just want to say that uh, for the K through 12 uh, section as that one is coming up, that would be very helpful for people in my position. I'm a college readiness uh, coordinator for my campus. So having all that information housed in one place would help us target our resources as, as well. So I think as you guys develop that, that's gonna be a really good tool for, especially us at the high school level to, you know, especially with like scholarships and things like that to look at uh, scores from, you know, things like college board and exams that they've taken in that nature. So. I think this is going to be a really good tool and I'm looking forward to you guys developing it and, and pushing it out there for us. So thank you. We appreciate that. Great. And Gilbert, I see your hand raised. Yeah, I was just curious for the future, my Texas future. Are you guys considering maybe linking some of the relevant student information and allowing the student to uh, decide to auto populate perhaps their applied Texas? Gilbert? Right on the money, yes. So um, ideally, a student starts creating their profile in middle school or whenever they are able to, to get into My Texas Future. So by the time it's time for them to apply to college, they probably have all their information in there that they could just enroll or apply using the Apply Texas, um, the next generation Apply Texas tool. So yes, absolutely. It's not going to sit separately. This will be very much connected, um, embedded application. That's great. Thank you. OK. Great. Well, Laura, yes. before we let you go, could you give us uh, your contact email so if anybody wants to contact you about these programs? Absolutely. I'll just write it in the chat. And if there's any other questions, I'm happy to answer them now as well. Um, just for our listening audience that doesn't have access to the chat, 
could you tell it to us as well? Oh, yes. Yes. It's Laura, L-A-U-R-A dot Brennan, B-R-E-N-N-A-N at higher ed dot Texas dot gov. Okay, thank you so much, because we do have a listening audience that can't, does not have access to the chat. So thank you again for the opportunity. I'm, I'm really honored that I was able to share that information with you today. Thank you so much for coming in sure. this awesome information. Okay, so our uh, next presentation we have is from Matt Parson, Assistant Commissioner for Workforce Innovation. Um, Matt, are you with us? I am. Good morning, everyone. Let me go ahead and begin sharing my screen. Good morning, everyone. I am Matt Parson, uh, so Assistant Commissioner for Workforce Innovation. I am excited to uh, chat with you this morning about the Texas Leadership Scholars Program. As my colleagues has previously said, um, a focus um, on equity has been one of the uh, commissioner's uh, number one focuses. And so we want to tell you guys about the Texas Leadership Scholars Program. So the goals of the Texas Leadership Scholars Program will be to create a premier leadership program um, with the goal of keeping high achieving low income Texas students in Texas as they pursue higher education. Uh, one of the things that we have been seeing is that students who are in the top 10 and even to the top 15 percent haven't been attending college anywhere and that's with uh, our our ability to see where students are going state to state with the clearinghouse data. We're seeing that they're not showing up anywhere, so we're looking to change this. So we will be supporting our high achieving low income students and the goal of it will be to create a cohort based uh, program that supports students. We have a lot of uh, different programs that are somewhat fragmented on all of our campuses, whether it's internship opportunities or uh, student success programs. Our goal is to use the things that we all have on our campuses in a robust and, and uh, wraparound fashion um, to support the students. And we're going to do this on the basis of uh, a cohort that begins this fall. So you might have seen something from UNT. They're our partner institution that will be administering this program. And we have been asking institutions to sign on for this first year's pilot uh, by June 15th. So thinking about students, um, we're looking for students who have uh, demonstrated not only financial need, but have shown leadership in their high school um, throughout the time that they were there. So we're thinking about students who are involved in their communities with uh, high achievement. So it has uh, a lot of the same components um, from Texas grants if you're thinking about those students, um, but we're throwing on essentially a scholastic record on top of that. So the student experience, this is something that I think um, I'm really excited about. Um, year one, we're going to have some of these live learning communities at some of our institutions that have already signed on. Um, but essentially we want to give these students an experience that they can mirror with their cohort of students at other campuses, right? So if we're thinking about students at UNT, we'll have students at Texas State, we'll have students at UT Arlington that are all a part of this, right? And so our goal is to facilitate mentoring programs, excuse me, um, undergrad research opportunities, and then again, the programming. So when we think about programming, we're looking at service projects, um, being able to develop their uh, digital portfolio, if you will, um, from a LinkedIn perspective, um, help with resumes. And then if you're looking at going to graduate school and or internship opportunities, we want to present that to our students. So some of the other benefits is having students come to Austin annually for the cohort uh, to meet the students who are in other uh, campuses uh, to kind of develop that bond and that relationship. Um, if you think about things like the Gates Millennium Scholars, um, Road Scholars, it's that that level of esteem that we're aiming to build. Again, this first year we'll be doing the pilot and we're excited to do that. 
So one of the good things about this is we're using some gear funds and we're going to go to the legislature to ask for additional funds for it on a continual basis. And so the goal of it is essentially to use the funds that are already coming to our campuses and we're going to add in our own dollars to support that. And so the goal of it will be to on the back end cover students uh, room and board uh, via a $10,000 stipend. And finally, um, we're looking to have additional institutional partners um, to uh, sign on for our pilot program. Again, if you don't participate this year, um, it will not preclude you from participating in the coming years. Um, and so we're looking to do that again June 15th. I think uh, a lot of the campuses vice president of student affairs and or enrollment managers uh, have seen this information. So the student process for the application this year is different. So since we are starting it basically this past spring, we're allowing students to apply for it as they've been accepted already to their institution. Uh, going forward is going to be selection um, by their high school advisors, teachers, principals and administrators. So we are again in tandem with uh, the University of North Texas on this. And so our contact information is here below. So Dr. Melissa McGuire is uh, working diligently with me on this. Um, and so our contact information is here. And um, with that, I would like to keep it short and turn it back to you all for questions. Can you tell us who the other partner schools are right now? Sure. So, um, so far it's UT Dallas, UT Arlington, Texas Women's, uh, Texas State, and UNT. And the information went to, you said, student affairs professionals at the school? Correct. And, and so we're, we're doing another rollout uh, that makes sure that it lives with enrollment management and financial aid. So uh, you'll be seeing some of that information soon. Shauna, you said in the future that it would be high school um, staff who would be making those decisions and choices. Do you know how that's going to be pushed out to the campuses or to the sure. high school? Yeah, so um, we will probably be working um, with Laura that just spoke um, to get the information pushed out through that mechanism of, of um, Texas on course. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Matt, I have a question for you. Um, sure. I understand the um, focus around four-year institutions. I do understand that. Um, but is would there be in the future some possibilities to work with community colleges with this this type of program as well? Sure, I think it's definitely something that we want to entertain because we don't want it to just be four-year institutions, but we would want to foster it for students who are going on the transfer track so definitely that is something that we are looking to to employ as well thank you any other questions for matt today thank you so much for visiting with us this is a looks like an awesome program we appreciate all your hard work for our students absolutely look forward to it Thank you. OK, as we proceed through our agenda, um, our next item is our external relations. Uh, John Wyatt, senior director, are you with us today? I am. Can you hear me? We can. Great. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Of course. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, again, I'm John Wyatt. I'm Senior Director for External Relations at the Coordinating Board. Uh, so I'm going to present uh, just a brief update on uh, some of the interim activities of the legislature uh, and then some things to expect in the, the lead up to the next session. Uh, you know, in a lot of ways, we're kind of in the, the calm before the storm right now. Um, so not, not a tremendous amount um, to report right now, but there are some there's some groundwork being laid um, that you need to be aware of. Um, as you may know, uh, House and Senate committees were provided with their interim charges earlier this year. Uh, so those interim charges um, really kind of provide the basis for what committees and 
what topics and questions that committees are going to consider in advance of the next legislative session, uh, kind of giving members a chance to collect information, uh, consider what their options may be, um, and potentially make recommendations for legislation um, on these, these topics. Um, so Commissioner Keller and agency staff have testified before several interim committees uh, already, um, providing information and perspective uh, on those charges. Uh, on May 5th, uh, Commissioner Keller testified for House Higher Education, um, and he presented uh, an overview and information on building a talent strong Texas, which, as you know, is our state's refreshed strategic plan for higher education. Uh, he also testified on May 10th before the Senate Higher Education Committee. Um, he testified on several issues, um, including enrollment trends at institutions, uh, workforce education, uh, and the Tri-Agency Workforce Initiative. Um, now, on that topic, he was joined by his Tri-Agency partners. Um, so those are uh, Commissioner Mike Morath of the Texas Education Agency uh, and Chairman Brian Daniel of the Texas Workforce Commission. Uh, and so the three together uh, laid out uh, kind of the work of the Tri-Agency Partnership, um, its focus on supporting uh, efficient and flexible pathways uh, to credentials, uh, it's focused on supporting students at all stages of education and transition into the workforce, uh, as well as creating a robust infrastructure across agencies for collaboration around common goals, data, and processes. Now, uh, they presented very similar testimony as well to the House um, International Relations and Economic Development Committee on May 19th. Um, so right now we're, we're in a bit of a, a pause uh, in terms of interim committee hearings. Um, usually during the summer they die down a bit and then late summer into fall um, we'll have additional hearings to address these still outstanding uh, uh, interim topics. Um, and then that will form the basis of the committees producing interim reports to the legislature, um, which will summarize their findings, their conclusions, and any recommendations that they have for the legislature. Um, so those will come out uh, likely in the fall. Um, another focus of the agency um, in terms of legislative activity is the legislative appropriations request, the LAR. Uh, so, as you know, the LAR is our formal request to the legislature um, regarding our budget for the next fiscal biennium, so fiscal years 24 and 25. Um, we actually, we're, we're kind of missing some key pieces right now. Uh, we have not gotten our instructions from the Legislative Budget Board uh, in terms of preparing the LAR um, or our base, um, so our GR base for kind of our starting point um, for that, um, for the LAR. Um, but we are having conversations internally about how we can best address student needs um, and advance uh, the goals of building a talent strong Texas through our budget. Uh, and then, of course, uh, from here through the rest of the session and, and throughout the session, uh, we're going to continue to support the legislature, to support institutions of higher education um, and our other stakeholders as an objective kind of relevant source of information and analysis. Um, on higher education topics. So, I mean, in short, like I said, kind of calm before the storm. You know, we're at a period right now where legislators are trying to figure out what their priorities are going to be going into the session, uh, what information and sort of backup do they need uh, in order to be able to have fruitful conversations um, around these topics. Um, so, we're we're doing. Um, kind of our best to make sure that we're providing the data, the analysis, um, and the feedback that's going to be relevant for, for legislators um, as well as all of our stakeholders. Um, so again, very, very brief kind of uh, snapshot, but I would be more than happy to answer any questions you may have. I have a couple of questions and comments, um, and I don't know if it goes like right here or if it goes later in our agenda, um, but probably a lot, you know, of things for us to kind of watch out for and um, really for Deshay, I guess, as well. Um, the selective service um, regulations with matching the federal, I think, is really important for next legislative session. And I don't know if that's kind of on the radar. But the other two big ones are um, the FAFSA changes that are coming for 24-25 and mirroring TASFA to match those changes. And that also includes a student aid index, which is a new formula for 
expected family contribution. And so I know it seems like it's so far away in 24, 25, but it's really not because we start implementing that in um, the fall, you know, before the 24, 25 FAFSA. So um, those are kind of three things that I know we have for financial aid offices on the horizon that are going to be big changes to FAFSA that would, you know, need to somewhat hopefully keep in sync TASFA and um, the new formula. And just to chime in, Bridget, yes, those are at least the FAFSA changes and how that will impact TASFA, both the online version we're launching in October as well as the paper application. Those are things that we are planning to look into as well as the student aid index um, to see where within our own administrative rules are there things that could be impacting how our programs are operating. So I can definitely say the two items that you mentioned are something that we do plan to look at and are looking at and have already had conversations related to those two. Um, specific to the selective service, I think that one is uh, an item that does keep coming up, um, not only within this committee, but within the financial aid community. And I believe we've said you know, this before, um, as far as the state is concerned and looking into how that changes statutorily, um, that is something that uh, if we, decide to you know move forward and bring up what that looks like statutorily we also want to keep in mind that if it brings any other potential changes um, statutorily to that we have to you know be prepared to what that looks like i can't uh, comment on whether that is something as far as an agency that is our um, top priority as far as our initiatives on moving forward but that is something that we're uh, clearly aware of um, from the financial aid community as far as wanting to align what the um, what's on the pipeline already federally and what that looks like on a state level so it definitely is something that has been heard and something that you know we will continue to look at to see um, how that places priority wise um, for our agency thank you john i have a question um you had talked about there was a report on the enrollment trends. Can you speak to kind of what the what they're anticipating those trends to be in the future? Um, so I, I I don't have the data right here. I, I don't know that we've done a projection um, on those trends. I, I mean the, the the trends are pretty pretty clear. You know we're having some real. Um, uh, struggles, uh, particularly with our two-year institutions, um, in terms of kind of the impacts that the the pandemic and and really even coming out of the pandemic have had uh, on their enrollments. Um, you know, again, one of the the key things that we're going to be doing um, going into the legislative session is providing the legislature with updated enrollment information. Um, so, as you know, those those formula funding decisions you know, depend on um, enrollment data. Um, and we update that um, not just going into the session, but even during the session um, as we get additional certified data. So, you know, our focus is making sure that um, the legislature has the most up-to-date information possible um, to make those decisions. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions for John? Thank you so much for your report. We appreciate all the work that you do for us. Absolutely. And if there's anything else I can answer, just let me know. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, our next agenda item is uh, the financial aid strategy priority report from um, Dr. Charles Cantero Pulse, the assistant commissioner. Hello, everyone. Thank you Good for morning. having me here today. So um, I've uh, come to the past few sessions or past few meetings to kind of bring you up to date on what's going on within uh, this strategic priority that we're working on. Um, and I uh, wanted to kind of tell you about the latest developments. Um, things are, are moving along. Um, don't know that I have anything major 
to to tell you about um, today, uh, but wanted to at least give you an idea of the the three main areas that we continue to work in. Um, one looking specifically at kind of the agency's strategic architecture um, and our um, you know goal of focusing on financial aid as one of those um, strategic priorities. Um, wanted to also mention a bit about where we stand with the transfer grant um, pilot um, as uh, part of this uh, strategic effort, um, as well as uh, the continued work on our technological infrastructure. In terms of the strategic priority itself, um, you know, we're continuing to work on the agency's strategic architecture throughout the agency. Um, you know, financial aid serves as the cornerstone for the agency's expand access strategic priority um, with the aim of optimizing financial aid to remove barriers to student enrollment, improve affordability, um, and enhance value. And we want to make sure that this strategic by priority benefits from a broad range of perspectives. Um, and so one of the pieces that we'd like to do is to make sure that we include all of your thoughts um, as part of the strategic exercise. Um, so what we're going to do is, is reach out to you individually to validate some very high level drivers um, for a financial aid ecosystem um, and also understand your thoughts on strengths and weaknesses of that system. So later this month, we're going to be in touch with more details, including a survey to gather your insight and feedback on these items. Um, and I'm, I'm really hopeful that all of you will take the time uh, to contribute to the agency's strategic efforts in this area by responding to that survey um, so that we can have a variety of input um, on this important topic. Um, the, the second of our three major work streams um, going on is the transfer grant pilots. Um, and next week, uh, public four-year institutions and the participating um, health public health related institutions will receive their first rosters of transfer grant recipients. Um, those um, rosters will include, um, they'll be on your list if the uh, individuals listed your institution on their 2022-23 FAFSA. Um, so that, that way you can have the information and you can pa uh, package that $5,000 fall transfer award. Um, when we spoke last time, I mentioned that there would be a certification of enrollment um, for those recipients in August, followed by a reimbursement certification in September um, so that we can reimburse you for the funds that you'll disperse um, for those individuals. Um, I also mentioned that we are looking to make this um, program, um, this pilot program, as administratively easy as possible for you all. Um, and so in that vein, we've actually eliminated the August enrollment certification. Um, we're not going to make you go in twice um, on these individuals. Um, what we'll be, we'll simply be looking for you um, to provide us with the reimbursement certification to indicate which recipients are enrolled at least three quarter time as of the institution census date. Um, so um, we want to just streamline this as much as possible. Um, if you have a recipient who is not three quarter time, you don't have to report anything. You're not going to have to give us an explanation as to why they're not getting the grant. Um, you're just going to tell us these are the people um, on your list that were at least three quarter time on the census date. Um, and that will allow us to then turn around and send you the reimbursement for the funds that you have um, already dispersed to those students. Um, so we are continuing to try to make this as administratively easy as possible. Um, and um, part of that actually gets into the next piece, which is our technological infrastructure. Um, we are hard at work um, 
doing our best to bring up new technology that's going to allow you to be able to go in um, and quickly indicate um, which students on your roster um, are um, did meet the requirements. Um, the goal um, is that that system will actually allow you to download um, your recipient rosters. So if you want to um, download the inter information to interact with your systems, um, you can, um, as well as to be able to upload um, rosters so that you can uh, batch indicate you know, who the recipients are um, to make the process easier, um, as well as having the ability if you need to, to go in on a one-by-one -one basis. Um, so we are working hard to make sure that all of that is in place in time for you all to be able um, to do that certification um, for reimbursement in uh, September. Um, in addition to bringing up the, the transfer grant reimbursement um, pro process uh, on the platform, um, we're also looking to bring up our two of our loan repayment programs, our peace officer program and our physician program. Um, and those we're targeting will go live in September. Um, and then after that, um, we'll be moving on to start to bring in more um, programs onto the platform, um, bringing on a couple additional loan repayment programs in the fall, um, as well as building out the new structure um, for making payment requests. Um, so we'll be starting with um, building it out for the Texas College Work Study program. Um, so that we have that ready for um, the 22, I'm sorry, the 23, 24 academic year. Um, our long term goal um, is to bring all of our programs into this. So if you need to request money for work study, for Texas grant, for TEOG, TEG, educational aid exemption, bilingual scholarship program, um, you'll be able to go to one place. Um, to do all of your um, requests and to track that information. Um, we, we are quite aware um, of the challenges that currently exist with the fact that you, you know, if you need to request a request money from us, um, you kind of have to figure out, okay, which program am I requesting and thus which uh, approach do I need to take to request that? Um, and we want to get away from that so that we can make this streamlined for you so that you'll be able to go into one place um, to be able to make all of your requests as opposed to having to take multiple routes depending on what kind of money um, you need from us. So it will likely take um, a couple fiscal years to make that happen. Um, we don't want to launch these things mid-year. Um, we don't want to have you like requesting one way for part of the year and then another way for another part of the year. We want to try to launch things at the start of a fiscal year. Um, and so, um, you know, the only one we're looking to launch for this fiscal year that's about to start um, in the fall will be the Texas transfer grant. Um, and then we're kind of figuring out, OK, which ones will we launch for fall 23? Um, Texas College Work Study will definitely be one of those. Um, and taking into account the, the recent negotiated rulemaking activity um, to adjust the allocation and disbursement um, process for that program. Um, we may be able to bring in a couple other programs for the fall of 23, um, and then the goal would be to bring the final programs in in the fall of 24. So that's the work that's going on right now. Um, as I mentioned at the start of this, we, we are looking for your input, and so we will be sending out um, some information later this month, and I, I hope you will take the time to, to respond and, and let us know whether or not the ideas we have on the financial aid ecosystem are in line with um, what you, you're thinking, um, as well as to help us kind of know the strengths and weaknesses that um, come to your mind so that we can be taking all of that into account in our planning. Happy to answer any questions that you have about our strategic priority, about the transfer grant pilot, or about our technological infrastructure work. Didi. 
Hi, uh, I have a question on the Texas transfer grants. Since they're yeah. gear funded, are yeah. is do we have clarification yet on whether they're supposed to be handled and administered like gear and reskilling, since those are also gear funded, where they don't affect current or future aid? Are they similar in that respect, since they're all gear funded? When I I apologize that I'm not connecting the dots. On that one, what are you referring to with reskilling and not impact? So, for example, the gear emergency funds and reskilling, when you give those funds, they should not affect current or future aid. So we don't offer them through our financial aid module. We put them as payments on the student account so that they're not affecting needs, so that they're not causing over budgets, et cetera. I'm asking if these grants are similar in that they should not affect current or future aid. The that is not the case. I can't speak for the reskilling because that's not a uh, piece in our area. The emergency funds that we did like two falls ago, I guess it was um, fall of 2020. Um, you know, those were for emergency purposes. Um, and yes, those were a separate process. This is like other financial aid. So um, this is built into the financial aid package. Um, I know that some of the information that has gone out already on the fact sheets includes um, information on, um, you know, our our desire to see individual um, individual financial aid packages kind of the focus on reducing their self help or their unmet need first um, before reducing any other grant funding. Um, but mm -hmm. these are financial aid items. Okay, because reskilling uh, reskilling is handled like the gear was, where it doesn't. So I just wanted to be clear on which way these needed to be. Handled. And again, I can't speak for reskilling because I haven't been involved in that program at all. Um, but I can say that the guidance that we've provided for this is that yes, these are built into the financial aid package. Okay, thank you, Bridget. I just wanted to add. Um, for I guess y'all's benefit too, we had asked about the Texas transfer grant funds, if they count towards the Texas transfer grant funds, if they count towards the Texas grant matching requirement, and we were told they do. So we would be treating them like normal aid, DD. And then we asked that specific question and, and received that answer as well. And I know we will continue to have some um, webinars um, throughout the summer um, as we kind of get to different pieces of the puzzle um, to try to answer or give the opportunity to answer questions about um, utilizing your recipient rosters. Um, once we have everything ready for the reimbursement certification process um, to be able to walk you through, you know, how that will look um, in the system. Um, and as well as um, uh, opportunities that are our, our public four years and the HRIs that are participating will actually um, kind of by default um, be our guinea pigs for some other features um, within the um, the grant and aid processing platform, um, the GAP. Um, is what we're calling it, um, and um, things like being able to identify who your institution's primary point of contact is, who your secondary point of contact is, who are um, uh, <coughs> reporting officials um, for a program, um, as well as just being able to put other individuals in for view access. So some of those features um, we'll be able to test out with the transfer grant program um, to then be able to expand those um, across all programs. Um, you know, the goal is to be able to eliminate some of the other activities such as the, um, um, <coughs> the user, um, the process when you need to add people um, to be able to have access to our Helmnet system or um, other systems that you'll be able to do that right through the gap and other things. Um, so um, we appreciate the uh, the four year publics and HRIs um, unwittingly helping us with some other features in this um, to make this uh, you know something that is going to be beneficial for everyone. 
And Charles, if um, I can add as well, as we continue to learn more about the processing in areas uh, that can help uh, those participating um, public universities and HRIs. We will try to pull together some uh, frequently asked questions that will allow you all to be able to have one place to kind of get some universal questions that are asked to us with some answers to it. So we are looking to work on that as well. Um, based upon the last webinar that we had, we um, got some really great valuable questions and we're looking at those to see how we can um, formulate a web page that will kind of give some uh, answers to those questions that may help you all as you um, continue to work with this program here. So I wanted to provide at least some um, information on what we're also looking at doing to support the schools. Any other questions on our strategic priority, the transfer grant or the technology build we're working on? Well, thank you for having me today. I appreciate it and I hope you have a good rest of the meeting. Thank you, Charles. We appreciate your updates all the time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, so our next agenda item um, would be our uh, task force subcommittee. And uh, we have uh, Claudette Jinks as the director of the uh, Task for FAFSA graduation requirement in college readiness and success. And Bridget Ingram is our subcommittee chair. So ladies, we will um, turn it over to you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so Leah Smalley typically provides the update. Uh, we kind of roll off, you know, sub. Each one of us kind of takes turn reporting to committee. I'll go ahead and do this today. And then, uh, Bridget, if we have any additional information, you can chime in. Uh, so we're going to talk to you a little bit about where we are in development of the online TASFA. Right now, the, the team is refining some of the help icons throughout the application process. Um, they're also mirroring the FAFSA questions where possible to align with our TASFA application as well. Um, we're working out some of the bugs that are related to both the college and high school tabs and adding a more robust e-signature feature. And then we're also refining the skip logic, uh, some of the error validations and some cosmetic changes. So it's a lot of bit of a little bit of specifics around the development. Uh, we also wanted to let you know that we're starting the UAT uh, testing. Our team has been uh, some of the team internally has been already conducting a user acceptance acceptance testing, which is UAT. It's in process right now, um, are in progress right now with our internal coordinating board staff. Uh, we're expecting to do external um, user acceptance testing in the coming weeks, actually, hopefully if we're on schedule starting next week um, over and over the summer with a with our existing subcommittee, our TASFA subcommittee. And as a reminder, the TASFA subcommittee is made up of both the subcommittee um, from this group, as well as our established online TASFA subcommittee work group. So it's become a more of a work group session. We have about 20 members of both uh, two-year, four-year nonprofit community-based organization uh, groups that come together and, and kind of get updated on this progress. And they're also being asked to help with the, the external uh, user acceptance testing as well. Uh, so we'll have about four iterations of testing, you know, to test different variations of the application. And that'll go from um, anywhere between June and all the way through mid-August. So um, we'll be doing that over the summer. Institutions will also be involved in the testing of the file transmission in the Move It system that will be happening later in the summer. And then we're also testing um, the online TASFA data transmission into the counselor suite. So those are the some of the testing things that will be happening over the summer. Um, I also wanted to update you. A lot of you should have received or your directors of financial aid uh, should have received a memo that was sent um, to each of the institutions of high
higher education on May the 10th. Uh, that memo communicated a couple of things. One, it was uh, outlining the TASPA file layout that will be sent to the institutions. And the, the memo also communicated that the TASFA data file will be sent to institutions in a fixed length text format. Uh, the document was created to mirror the ICER record layout where possible. Uh, it also includes a header, a footer, and detailed applicant record to provide the start and end positions for the data collected from each question or input on the TASFA. And then the TASFA files will also uh, will be sent daily using the coordinating board's online portal MoveIt DMZ to the institution's dedicated TASFA output folder. So these are some of the things that we wanted to update you on. I think a lot of the institutions are already familiar with that MoveIt system. Another thing that the memo communicated was that the uh, Texas Administrative Code was updated for Section 22.6. Uh, this was cl it clarified uh, institutions participating in state financial aid programs must accept the data generated by the completion of the online TASFA and that institutions may accept the paper version uh, of the TASFA from applicants who do not have access to the necessary technology to complete the online TASFA. Uh, this code also had institutions can require an applicant to submit additional information with data received on the TASFA. We also wanted to let you know that we're working with our internal, our agency's marketing and communications department to start beginning to inform stakeholders about the launch of the online task fund that's scheduled to be in October of this uh, 2022, and that we're also working with the Texas OnCourse team. I believe you guys heard an update or uh, received a presentation from them earlier, but we're working with the Texas OnCourse team to update the academy modules that are available to counselors and other users, and, is, and also working with that team to prepare, prepare training on the online TASFA um, over the summer. Uh, also wanted to let you know that we're continuing to seek funding um, from our, our, our groups to look at other ways to improve the online TASFA by our, one of the next steps that we're exploring is creating a Spanish version and an administrative portal uh, for the coordinating board to be able to troubleshoot and identify technical issues. So um, that's all that I have as far as an update. I'm open to any questions as well. Thank you so much, Claudette. Any questions uh, about the online task for Gilbert? Yeah, I, I heard you mention you were going to be testing uh, the inclusion of the TASFA data in the counselor suite. Yes. And is the intention is the intention that the testing will allow for that data to be uploaded uh, so counselors can track progress by October? Uh, or do you anticipate, you know, you'll have the functionality, but the the reporting process will will lag behind the the actual capacity to submit. Our intention is, you know, as the application rolls out, it should be since we have the data internally through this application, there would not be a processing time. Typically, I think um, for those of you unfamiliar, our agency has an agreement with the U.S. Department of Education. And we receive FAFSA data to um, upload into the Apply Texas Counselor Suite. The Counselor Suite is a tool that is uh, where counselors and authorized users are able to track student progress on applications as well as the FAFSA completion. And one of the things that we did to, to align this work is to, to incorporate that TASFA data that's coming from the application. So whatever, whatever we have, the data should be um, presented in a timely manner. Uh, since we at the agency have built the, the application, the functionality should uh, flow, the data should flow into the uh, counselor suite in a more timely manner. I hope that answers your question, Gilbert. But it, there, there shouldn't uh, be a lag. It's, we're intending to start it out as soon as it's, as it's launched. Ed? You had mentioned the ability to um, submit a paper application directly to the school. Uh, is there any uh, attempt or thought of if the student is applying through the school, that information then flows back to the state? I mean, is the state interested in knowing the whole of 
the population of students who complete the FAFSA? That's something we've definitely kind of thought about uh, through this process because I, I understand the value of tracking every TASFA. And if there's a way to do so, currently that's not in our scope of work with this particular project, but it's something that we can start exploring as we're, as we're moving this forward. Do you see eventually the electronic TASFA being the only way that a student can complete the TASFA? Uh, uh, you know, is this kind of just interim the paper or is the paper always going to be an option for students? I and that that might be a Deche question. I believe though that we're offering the paper option. It's the same as we do for the Apply Texas application. We also offer a paper option for admission. So we're mirroring that same process. But uh, Deche, I'll go ahead and turn that over to you. Um, that isn't conversations that we've currently had. One thing to keep in consideration is that not every student has access to technology um, as it relates to trying to do something online. So a paper option is available for students if they are uh, able to get it printed out um, or submitted. Um, so that isn't anything currently we've been looking at as far as the elimination of paper option, but um, it is something that we can look further down the road if we feel like that should be the only way is online for a student. We don't want to limit the ways that a student can actually get the information to you all, but I, like I mentioned earlier, Ed, as well as Claudette, you know, being able to track that if it's in two different formats could be a little challenging when it comes to data, but again, um, something we'll look at maybe later on, but not something that's on as a priority to eliminate the paper application at this point. Any other questions about the uh, online TASPA or any anything dealing with um, that right now? Okay, hearing none, um, I'm thinking that we might want to take a break uh, for about 10 minutes. Is that good to say? Yeah, I think that works. All right, let's take a 10 minute break and we will be back at um, 1042.
Okay, I think everybody's kind of logging back in from a much needed break. We've had a jam packed agenda today and we thank you for the great questions so far and and the attention. Um, our we'll move on with our agenda as soon as everybody's back in. We don't do we need to confirm? Okay. So I'm going to go through our list again and just make sure everyone's back. Um, so if you would just respond by saying here, uh, Ed Presley. Jackie Adler. Here. TV Insides. Here. Joseph Ruiz. Millette Leaf Green. Here. Thomas Ratliff. Here. Victoria Chen. Rachel Garrett, Rochelle Garrett. Here. Joy Thomas. Here. Here. Bridget Ingram. Here. Here. Didi Gonzalez. Here. Here. Holly Nolan. Here. Shauna Norton. Here. Sal Ramirez. Here. Gilbert Zavala. Here. Robert Marino. Present. Deshae Reed. Here. Okay, let me go back. Uh, Ed, have you joined us yet? Ed Caressley? I'm here. Victoria Chen? I'm here as well. Okay, awesome. Very, very good. Thank you, guys. Uh, we'll proceed with the agenda, and I'll turn it over to Didi Gonzalez, our Data Collection Subcommittee Chair. Okay, thanks, Denise. Uh, the Data Collection Subcommittee made on April 28th. We had our first agenda item was an update on the online TASFA, which we all got just a little bit earlier. We also got an update on the FAD data modernization project, and it seems that project has been delayed based on additional programming. And the plan now is to do testing during the summer and to test around cycle two. And I believe the targeted go live is for 21-22 cycle three FADs. And Deshae can correct me if that's changed. <laughs> um, we also got some updates on the Office of Student Financial Aid Programs. There were some memos about the program guidelines coming out and our preliminary allocations, which I think we've all received. We had an update on the authority to transfer process, Texas College Work Study Summer Awarding, and the Texas Transfer Grant. <clears throat> There was also a discussion topic on reporting gender. A couple of schools are considering uh, how to make changes to gender, ident gender identification, but uh, the coordinating board said they're not at this time planning on making any changes to reporting for gender on their reportings or the online TASFA. We also discussed the net price calculator and future topics for the financial aid webcasts. That was pretty much it. Any questions? Thank oh, you. Cool. Short and sweet today, Dee Dee. <laughs> You're going. Um, <laughs> also, Chase, our student representative, is with us as well. Um, okay. No questions for Dee Dee about data collection. Um, our next agenda item is our legislative subcommittee. Arnold Trejo is our subcommittee chair and he is not with us today. Um, so we will go ahead and just, I don't know of any updates. He didn't send anything to me. Um, are there anyone, is there anyone on the call on the TASFA legislative committee? Okay, we will, uh, Assume there's no updates for that committee at this time. Our next update is from um, TASFA. 
Uh, Robert Marino is our task force president. Robert, I'll turn it over to you. Sure, thank you. I just have a couple of items. Uh, first is that we hosted our uh, new aid officers workshop in April. Uh, it was very successful. We have uh, 95 uh, new uh, financial aid officers register and uh, many attended, so it was uh, very successful. Um, we will be opening the uh, opening the uh, TESPA awards nominations here in the next week. So if you want to recognize, you know, those employees that have done, you know, outstanding work in your uh, offices, please do so. Uh, we will open the nominations like say next week. Um, and then uh, from July 29 to August 15, we'll be hosting our uh, elections for the 22-23 uh, uh, task force board directors. And that's all. Thank you, Robert. Um, our next agenda item is our high school district update. Ben is not with us. Shauna, do you have anything for today? Um, well, what I kind of plan to report on was basically on the, the FAFSA graduation requirement that we have now. Um, now that the school year is kind of over, we are we looked at our numbers and even though our enrollment was down in our district, and we also had a regional meeting the other day where we kind of talked about this as well. So enrollment was kind of down across the board everywhere, um, but everyone processed more applications this year than what they have in previous years. Our district specifically focused, uh, processed about 30 to 40 more FAFSA applications for each of our three high school campuses um, than what we have in the past. And additionally about, um, Overall, between our three high school campuses, we probably uh, processed about mm, 30 to 40 more TASFA applications as well. So um, during our regional meeting and some other meetings we've had, one of the things that we have, we, we've wondered from the college perspective is um, what we're hoping to see is that y'all see increased enrollment from those. And I don't know how... I don't, I don't know how quick, um, quickly we could get that data as to whether or not that's happening. I don't know if in the fall we would have some data on that. Um, if not, what we were wondering is if this is just a lot more work for y'all to process all of the applications for students who are actually never going to enroll in college. Um, so those are just some of the discussions that we have been having from our end in the in the K through 12. So. That is... Um some thought provoking questions right there. Um, I'm not sure that it necessarily would provide more work for us. Uh, a lot of our systems are automated. Um, so they come in and, and we have additional information that we request from students as they come in, if they're in verification and, and what have you. And, and those students um, that complete um, I think that goes to our whole conversation on retention and, and recruiting and, and the students that come from the high school that do fill out the FAFSA that don't ever complete the process. That would be a very interesting um, st statistic to um, look at and kind of analyze to see the, the completion rate and the actual um, matriculation from high school to college. So I think we've got some data hopefully we can use in the future to kind of give us some information and some guidance on where we need to be focusing our recruitment and um, potentially retention uh, down the road a, a, a little bit. Any other questions for Shauna? I, ha I see a hand up. Hold on. Uh, Bridget. Yeah, I think... Um I think it's hard to correlate, you know, enrollment increase with FAFSA completion, but I also think there's somewhat of a disconnect with students from high schools that are filling out, you know, high, the task of FAFSA. If they never apply, then they're not getting financial aid packages to then, you know, so I think it is kind of that whole, you know, following the data through and seeing, because for us, you know, they have to be, um, admitted before we will award them so it is you know encouraging there's that that gap of they fill out the FAFSA TASFA but if they never apply to any college they don't know what their award package would be and then they don't you know decide whether to come or not so um, I think it is going to be interesting to see a lot of the um, research that's happening on this and you know where we are 
in the next couple of years. But um, as Denise said, we don't, you know, for us, it's automated packaging. So, um, you know, it's not a huge difference, but um, then we end up canceling. A lot of students don't come, you know. Gilbert? Yeah, I, I guess maybe this is a, a question inspired by, by Shauna's comment, but is there a plan to look at what the impact that or correlation is on, on actual FAFSA or TASFA completion college enrollment? Um, because on our end, we, we have a partnership with the University of Texas where we do track student enrollment persistence, completion, and even employment outcomes. And what we found is about 80% of our FAFSA completers actually enroll in college. And it's also correlated with degree completion over six years. So I, I would imagine there's got to be data on this statewide. But, you know, with the new graduation requirement, you are increasing the share of students that are that are applying that might not have a, an intent to enroll. But the benefit is that they've, you know, if they do decide to enroll, then at least they've gone through that process. And for us, the priority is to encourage direct enrollment because that also correlates with, with completion. So I'm just curious if there is a plan to, to look at the impact of aid completion and the graduation requirement and actual enrollment. Um, I mean, we've gone through two odd years, right? So even if students were filling out a FAFSA and were accepted, they might have had a change of plans, right? Especially at two-year schools, um, not so much at the four-year, but I'd just be interested. I think that that data would be useful in terms of informing future policy conversations. I agree. I'm not sure what, a, I guess, Deshay with the coordinating board actually run that kind of data? I can definitely research it and look into it to see if uh, not something we have on hand, but uh, to find out if we can get someone to come in and speak to the larger committee on that. So I jotted that down to look into, and so hopefully we'll be able to have someone at our next meeting or two um, be able to kind of bring in some more data-driven um, information to us as it relates to some of these newer items that have come down the pipeline. Can I add real quick, there is a um, American Institute for Research, AIR, A-I-R dot org, that is doing some research on this. And um, I'm on the advisory board. I don't know that I have a lot to contribute, but um, Claudette Jinks is as well. So that might be something to watch. Um, we had a meeting about a month ago, and um, they are doing a lot of, you know, research. Richard Sapp is on the committee, too, which I don't know if y'all remember Richard from <laughs> the old TG days. It was good to see him, but he's on um, the advisory board as well. So it's AIR.org is the place that's doing the, some of the research for this. The, the National <laughs> College Access Network is also has also done some, I think, longitudinal research at the national level. Um, so they might be, and they, maybe they're working with AIR, um, but uh, they might be interesting to talk to and happy to make a connection if that's helpful. Yeah, I think that bringing these forward and if you um, know of other uh, organizations or if you are a part of other advisory committees um, sitting on, you definitely can bring these forward to the group and we can connect with um, having someone come and present to the larger group. So. Bridget, uh, Gilbert, definitely, since you all have some connections, let's see what we can do to bring this forward as a presentation for the larger community to have. Awesome. Uh, Robert. Yeah, so there is uh, a, a correlation between increase of passport completion and increase in enrollment and even retention. Uh, I recall correctly data from Dallas uh, when they implemented the Promise program. Uh, the students, uh, when they complete a financial application, they realize they actually have financial aid. Before that, they didn't realize they could qualify. So just the fact that they were asked to complete the financial application, you know, allowed them or encouraged them to, to register for classes. Um, so, uh, but, but also we have to be careful uh, with the number of increases because we just implemented a promise program here in my college for that includes all high schools before it was only three high schools. 
And right now I'm seeing a uh, 20% increase in, in uh, festival applications, I mean, uh, financial applications overall. Uh, so, uh, and we did this because of money that we had received from different areas. So, and I know a lot of schools that implemented different initiatives with her money. So, uh, and I don't know if that, you know, those projects are encouraging, you know, uh, more enrollment over the just the fact that the state is requiring the test for test for completion for graduation. Any other questions or comments for Shauna? I think it's just awesome that we can come together and actually talk about this this stuff with with the ISDs present and um, the feedback I think is just invaluable for us. And we appreciate Shauna your willingness and um, to bring these things forward so we can uh, actually think about it and, and look at the research. So thank you so much. Um, our next agenda item is from um, Deshay Reed our Senior Director at the Coordinating Board on the Office of Student, Student Financial Aid Programs. Deshae? Um, I'll go ahead and just be, you know, pretty quick about some recent announcements, upcoming deadlines, and accomplishments um, within FBT from the last time we were together as a group. Uh, so for recent announcements, it was mentioned earlier in our committee meeting uh, regarding the file layout. There was the TASFA um, for fiscal year 24 file layout that was released on May 10th. We also released on May 17th uh, those who participate in the Good Neighbor Program program, the FY23 selected students, so that went out on May 17th, as well as we released a user access 2022 annual review for our financial aid web portals that was released on May 17th. Um, and on May 23rd, we also released our three grant program guidelines. And so all of those announcements are listed on our student financial aid web page under Stay Connected. So if you haven't had an opportunity to look at those, um, please feel free to go out there and look at all of those recent announcements as well as any others that we have. As as far as our deadlines, as far as upcoming deadlines, I want to point out that we did release a review data for our uh, several of our programs, our Texas Grant Program, our Texas College Work Study Program, Work Study Student Mentorship, and Educational Aid. Um, so we release preliminary um, allocations along with data related to those programs. And if you have any uh, discrepancies that you feel um, were listed within that data, you do have until June 6 to submit a discrepancy form, as well as if you want to opt out of the work study or the work study student mentorship program or edu educational aid exemption program, you also have until June 6 to complete the opt in opt out form. So for those of you who have yet to look at your data, June 6 is on a Monday, so that's not too far away from here. So make sure that you do visit um, that memo, look at that those spreadsheets to make certain that the data is accurate before we move forward to final allocations. On June 10th, is a deadline for the user access annual review. So if you have yet to look over all that uh, security um, portals and the individuals at your institution that we have here, uh, make sure to look at that spreadsheet to determine whether or not those individuals listed on that spreadsheet that we sent out are actually still at your institution and they have the right um, security for those web portals. Again, that's June 10th to submit the online verification form. So every school does need to submit the online verification form to us. So we know that you have actually looked over um, that spreadsheet and confirmed that the individuals at your institution should actually have that same security access. On June 15th, we plan to open up 
FADS uh, cycle two for the fiscal year 22. And we will be opening that cycle up and it will still be in the current Move It portal. So for those schools who are ready to go with their FAD file, um, June 15th for cycle two will begin. If you're still working, I think we had a few little handful of schools who are still trying to wrap up cycle one, then we highly encourage you to kind of uh, finish that off because you won't be able to get into for cycle two. And lastly, if you are thinking of transferring any of your funds between work study and any of the three grant programs, so whether that's work study um, mentorship or whether that's Texas College work study and you want to transfer that into your grant program so you can continue to award more students um, aid over the summer or vice versa, if you want to go into your grant programs, into your two work study programs, you have until July 1st to submit a online request, and that is the authority to transfer request form, which is due July 1st to start that process. So those are all the upcoming deadlines that we have out. We also released our summer 22 institutional calendar, which also can be found on the student financial aid webpage under Stay Connected. And last, we have a couple of accomplishments that we've done uh, since the last time, we, again, we met as a group. Um, we were able to open the Texas Armed Service Scholarship Program nomination portal. So on April 19th, to our legislators so they can submit their nominations for the 22-23. So for those institutions who actually participate in TASP, um, legislators are starting to do some nominations for the 22-23 year. Um, we did encourage the offices to submit uh, their nominations by August 1st. So that way you all have an idea of who's coming or returning back into your uh, school by August 1st. And, the final deadline actually for the legislators is October 31st. So we gave it, like I said, a priority deadline of um, August 1st, but they have until October 31st to submit their nomination. We're also testing a new process called watch list. Um, watch list will identify borrowers, student borrowers who have loans in default or litigation status in our loan management system. And what we'll, that will do, it will pause the application process for a new loan, alerting that borrower to contact our office to discuss uh, the status of their account. And so we're really happy about this new feature. It um, helps improve um, our proactiveness to the students and doesn't get them caught up later on about not having their aid dispersed in time. So we'll kind of pause their process, make sure that they can get out of the status that they're in so they can continue to move through that loan application process. On July 1st, we will also begin testing um, for federal interest rate changes that will take effect, um, and that will include any rate changes for our variable um, rates for our college access loans. Um, we were able to um, complete uh, and update our system for our uh, schools who participate in the college access loan in our system, we have added the 22-23 uh, allocations that you can start um, looking into as far as awarding, and that has been already updated um, in our system. So for those schools who are already anxiously trying to certify for 22-23, especially the summer header schools, you shouldn't have an issue with that. So those are all the accomplishments um, that we've done so far. And like I mentioned, those upcoming deadlines, which you can find on our institutional calendar, um, as well as um, our recent memos. And any questions from you all over that information? Great, Denise. Thank you, Deshae. Thank you, I appreciate the update. Um, our next item on our agenda is uh, the recognition of our members that it will be stepping down uh, from our committee as of uh, this will be their last meeting. And I would like to recognize them for their service for us, uh, with us for some the last two years and some even longer than that. And we appreciate uh, your willingness to serve and to volunteer um, to be with us for these meetings and to contribute. Um, the first one I'd like to thank uh, specifically is Ed Caressley. He's our past chair. He um, 
we appreciate Ed your leadership uh, on this committee and your your service as uh, you um, actually roll off. And I'm not sure I've been to a meeting without Ed in in the room. So Ed, we will be missed, but we appreciate what you have done for our our committee. Thanks. Uh, I've enjoyed uh, serving on this committee and, and contributing as best I could. So um, look forward to continue to keep track of what this committee is doing. Um, always valuable information. So thank you. Our other members that are uh, rotating off will be Joy Thomas from Prairie View University, Ben Bolin, our high school representative, and Jace, our student representative. And Jace, if you would, would you tell us how to say your last name? Uh, Kugia. Kugia. Thank you so much, Jace, for your um, willingness to participate as our student representative. Uh, Stephen, no problem. Thank you for asking. Sure. Stephen Peterson um, actually is resigned because he re has uh, moved to another institution. Uh, Robert Marino, our task force president and task force representative, he will be rolling off. Um, also, uh, Thomas Ratliff, his term has ended and uh, he will be rolling off as well. Thank you all for your service and we appreciate uh, all that you're, uh, you contribute to our financial aid community. Any questions or comments about our members that are rolling off? All I got to say is, it's, uh, it's been a long six years. <laughs> <laughs> No, yes. I actually enjoy every moment of it, <laughs> but I'm glad there's, you know, I need to focus on something else. <laughs> Wait, now, Robert. Thank you all. Um, I've seen you all in different um, aspects of being here at the agency. Either I was sitting in the background and now I'm in the forefront. So, and I appreciate everyone's um, contribution and um, support um, along the, uh, the way. So, a lot of you, like you said, Robert, six shares, and you know, it's about the same. So it, uh, it's nice to see the longevity of some of you all here. So, any other comments? Okay, so we'll go to our next agenda item, which um, we have to replace these folks that are rolling off. So, Deshay, I'll turn it over to you. Yes, so we wrapped up our nomination process um, going in for uh, the next uh, cycle of uh, FAA members. Um, we are going forward with recommending um, individuals that are coming from um, public university, privates, HRIs, community college, and one of our ISDs. So we have two uh, nom uh, nominations that we're moving forward for public universities, two from privates, one from a from an HRI, one from a community college, and one from an ISD. So I'm going to kind of list out who those uh selected nominees are. Uh, they will go through our board. Once they are actually approved by the board, then they will have their very first meeting with us in September. So the selected nominees are Reginald Brazel from Lamar University, Scott Lipinski from the University of Texas Permian Basin, Linda McK uh, Kendrick from University of St. Thomas, and Thomas Ratliff is going to be back with us again um, from Abilene Christian University. Joseph Sanchez from the University of North Texas Health Science Center. Gabby Leon from Alden Community College. Lisa Sherburn, who's going to be representing El Paso ISD. And then we'll have Didi Gonzalez, who's going to be representing as the TASFA representative. So can't wait to welcome um, some familiar faces as well as newer faces in September um, once they are approved by our board. Thank you, Deshay. Thank you. Is there any questions or comments? Okay, our next uh, topic is um, a discussion topic addressing the unemployment compensation reported by parents and students. Um, Deshay, I'll send it back to you. That's right, I'm back again, guys. Um, 
So I think we're still in the morning session, right? So <laughs> good morning again. Uh, so this was kind of brought to our agency and we wanted to get a feel and idea of what may be happening or what you're seeing at your um, institutions. Um, Congressional changes to the tax treatment of untaxed income benefits, we're seeing that could impact financial aid for some students and um, families that were applying for um, financial aid right now. Essentially, some families may have included these untaxed income benefits as their adjusted gross income for 2022. And we're trying to see if that may have created some um, changes or challenges to what they would have been receiving as awards. And if you are um, familiar with that or that's been brought to your attention, and if so, the agency was just wondering, you know, how are you working with these families that may have had some issues with uh, that particular uh, benefit that was a part of their tax return? Um, have you seen any impact with um uh, any financial aid awards that were being offered. So it's really just a dialogue to see if based upon how they completed their tax return, did it have some impact to what you're seeing as you're providing financial assistance to these students and their families? I can tell you that an article came out regarding this. Um, NASPA released it. Um, we also got information from um, another one of our organizations regarding it. And maybe I should ask, is anyone familiar with it starting there? I see some head nods at least. <laughs> well, I don't remember the exact details. <laughs> But I know, yeah, there was guidance from a, um, I think an electronic announcement about the unemployment compensation. But I don't, I'd have to get the very specifics from our staff that processes. Okay. Well, if you think of anything, we're very interested in knowing, you know, have you seen any impacts um, based on um, the guidance that was offered as you looked at awards um, to determine if there were any kind of impacts to uh, those students or families who, again, may have um, included those benefits um, within their adjusted gross income. So you're asking, I guess, in the yeah, in the announcement, it says Ed's waiving the inclusion of these untaxed unemployment compensation amounts from need analysis altogether. So you're asking us how we're processing it, or you're asking if it's causing a change in the financial aid for students? Both. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is that I'll venture into this because this is my last meeting. So, um, but uh, I mean, I think this really, at least the way that we interpret it is guidance. Uh, and I think I'm making the right connection was given um, that if a individual received unemployment um, we were given a little more latitude and direction as to how we might address it in professional judgment. And so we could zero out the income for that individual versus um, a normal approach, maybe of special circumstances of trying to reestablish a level of income that is reflective of the current situation. And so um, <laughs> the way that I've interpreted that is we've taken that as, you know, we have additional latitude in professional judgment as we address um, individuals who present to us that they're receiving unemployment and, um, you know, giving them more of a benefit of a doubt or less strenuous um, uh, collection of information to say, show us what your current income is, you know, um, and so we, you know, guides that I've given for uh, uh, our professional judgment approach is, you know, again, making good judgment, but realizing, um, you know, we have a little more flexibility. Um, and, and so that, you know, that I think is what it's addressing. Um, generally, what I've heard, I mean, we've had a, maybe a slight uptake of uh, uh, special circumstances, you know, people saying, hey, my income is not the same as it was. Um, but I wouldn't say that we've been flooded with 
huge numbers of uh, you know students and or parents who are coming to us who are saying, hey, you know, my current financial situation is significantly different than it was as presented in 2020 or 2019, and you know, and and seeking um, uh, you know accommodation. I mean, definitely a greater number you know of, of families that we've dealt with, um, but. Uh, even with the requirement under uh, the HERF guidance that we needed to communicate to families the opportunity for special circumstances um, and all of that, again, did not see an overwhelming response of, of people coming to us and saying, hey, we need a reevaluation of our application for financial aid because it doesn't reflect, you know, um, where we're at. So that would be my take on what I think this issue is, is I think saying, hey, has this significantly changed? Has it made? Or on the other hand, you know, um, because families maybe aren't presenting their situation to us, are there a number of families that are being under awarded um, as a result of that um, and um, at least from my standpoint, other than communicating this opportunity, we've not instituted any internal method to try to identify applications that have come in where their tax returns may represent, you know, may uh, present um, one-time income or something different, and try to, you know, specifically target individuals and say, hey, you know, we, you know, we see you know, something a little different, we want to help you. So, I mean, that's, you know, we've not gone that far um, in any particular way systematically. And I don't know if other schools have to try to identify that um, without the individual, the student or the, or the, or the parent family um, presenting their situation to us and allowing us to assist them with any changes of circumstances. And thank you. I definitely appreciate that particular feedback. I do see um, some other hands and um, they're um, in the chat and we will uh, put it out there is where that article um, was provided. And again, an agency, we were just wondering, you know, what are you all, you know, doing as it comes to processing? How are you uh, assisting those families? Are you seeing, like you mentioned, a influx of families coming to you regarding um, the issue with that? So, I appreciate Ed your feedback on that, and like I said, I did see some other hands that go up. Um, Gilbert, I think you had your hand up, but then um, Robert, I saw yours as well. So Gilbert, yeah, I was just trying to understand the issue. Is it is it that the unemployment payments are considered income and and or being used to offset aid, or is it something else? Yes. So being that it is part of that adjusted gross income could in, uh, inflate what it is um, when it comes down to awarding um, any type of financial aid. So it can be considered very higher than what it probably would have been. Got it. Thank you. And just to add, that could make a change in a student's uh, awarding uh, as far as what they could be eligible for. So that's really where the key piece of this is that um, if their adjusted gross income is, you know, look to be higher, that does play a part when it comes to calculating what currently is the EFC. So if that EFC is um, higher than what it would have been, that could potentially have an impact on the type of financial aid they would have received, meaning they could have um, received Pell, but because of those benefits being included in just in Chrome as it was calculated, that may have adjusted that EFC and knocked them out of maybe potentially a Pell range or other um, need-based aid. Um, so that's where that impact could come from um, with awarding. So maybe that also gives some better kind of clarity of how that would impact a student and a family because of that. Robert? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, this is going to be kind of hard to identify because, I mean, the only time we will be able to identify students in that situation is through verification. And uh, so to begin, you know, the year, you know, uh, 
verification selection was very low. For us, it was only about 9% of the test was received. And I think that's the trend for all colleges. Uh, but then even if through verification, if they select, if they did the uh, data retrieval tool, then uh, they will be required to submit tech returns. So we won't have any knowledge that they have unemployment income. Uh, and now that we received a waiver for verification, schools like us, where we typically get most of our documents through the month of June, we won't know anymore. Um, so it's going to be hard. The only time we can we're going to be able to identify them is uh, when we notify them as we require by our part to inform them about you know a special circumstances you know, uh, income adjustments uh, and, and they self-identify. That will be the only time we will know if they come forward and let us know that uh, their income is no longer the same. Right. Well, I appreciate everyone's at least feedback on kind of how they were using the guidance and what they see happen at their campus. And I agree with you. It would be very challenging to identify who at, um, is impacted versus who is not if they aren't, you know, coming to you and making it you aware of their situation. Um, just wondering if it was something that was out there to help the families kind of know to go to you when it comes to special circumstance and it, that may be you know another avenue that they're uh did not realize um with it so i have jotted that all down so i appreciate again the feedback and thank you all so much um for what you all are doing to help those students um, whether impacted by this or other changes in income especially in these last couple of years that we've been in Thank you, Deshay. Um, I know there was a comment in the chat and for some reason my chat feature is not working. So if someone could see what that comment is and if it needs to be shared. Uh, it was the link um, to the uh, article on NASFA. Okay, awesome. Okay, our next topic of discussion is leveraging financial aid. And we've asked Thomas Ratliff to uh, give us a presentation about what uh, they're doing. Thomas? Yes, let me, uh, I'm trying to get to the point where I can share my screen. So I apologize if I'm slow with my own tech. Did I make it? Is there a PowerPoint, I guess, yes. is what I should be asking. Yes, yes you're good. <laughs> Yay, all right, we're at least in the right category. Um, <laughs> I appreciated uh, Denise's invitation to uh, be able to speak about leveraging financial aid. It's a topic that many of us here on the call have uh, probably a great deal of familiarity with, but I don't want to assume that everyone does. Um, so to help us all stay on an understanding playing field, if you will, that's level. Uh, I'll be hitting some of the topics that uh, are regarding leveraging financial aid and, and uh, trying to uh, just cover some of the terminology and some of the concepts that are present with it. And hopefully that'll be a, a useful thing that'll lead to some questions at the end that I wanted to pose relative to some of the practices that we are doing collectively. Some of the basic concepts for higher education leveraging is to use calculated financial assistance in very specific ways to influence the enrollment decisions for specific groups of students, students that have particular characteristics that are desired by our schools. And also, uh, to some degree, as a secondary step, to help ensure that our educational options at our institutions appear to be affordable for each of the students. Uh, relative to the specific characteristics, a lot of schools want a lot of different unique people. And uh, I've had many an admissions representative who has shared with me that it's pretty much a consistent slate, just the brightest students throughout the country who are also extraordinarily wealthy and are engaged with the university and have potentially contributing parents and, and, and. And all of them kind of shake their heads because a lot of those are uh, conflicting priorities. Uh, and very difficult to keep a good balance going. And it's also interesting that in our industry that we do use our financial aid and our different options for financing and education 
in ways that are so targeted. In many other industries, they offer a coupon or a discount, you know, come in on Tuesday, get 10% off. And it's for anyone that is looking for their product. But in higher education, we tend to lean much more focused at individual student groups. And there are some particular reasons for that, but uh, it also lends itself to some limitations. So some of the reasons for targets include initial recruitment of students, and that's where most people tend to think of financial aid leveraging, but it also leans more in additional directions as well, helping with retention, helping to meet statistical goals that the university might want. Maybe they are eagerly seeking to have students from all 50 states. And if they're lacking from a couple of those states, they might offer additional incentive monies to the first student who comes in from that state, just because that helps put one more tick in the little number categories to show how broadly their university is being reflected upon by individuals throughout the whole nation or throughout their particular region. Uh, sometimes they may target particular students with additional funds because they are known as being a leader at their uh, high school or the institution that they're transferring from, if it's a two-year school. And there may be some hope that they might bring multiple friends along with them. If we can get one, maybe we can gain three from that particular location. Uh, there are some that uh, admissions uh, representatives at different schools who are given the charge to try to lean towards recruiting students whose families or the student themselves might prove to be good for the advancement office to have conversations with much further down the road. Um, it's kind of an optimistic thought at times because you never know who's going to be a phenomenal success in their lives as they move forward. Uh, but there are some times where that comes into the conversation point. And also relative to improving recruitment of faculty and staff, uh, part of that is through discounts for those individuals, for their families or for themselves to pursue their educations. Other times it might be just because of the, uh, the status that might come as an association with a particular institution as they see different population groups choosing to attend that institution. And it may help draw the attention of potential employees in the future. Most of the focus uh, for leveraging, as I referenced before, tends to be hinged on the initial discussion about recruiting students. I want to walk briskly through the enrollment funnel. You may hear references to this if you're not familiar uh, with the admissions protocols very much. But you start with a wide group of people, anybody who might be thinking about or considering your institution as a prospect. And those who actually reach out and let you know, yes, I want to learn more information about you. I want to feel out more of the situation that might be if I became a member of your group. Those are inquiries who then may file a formal application after a conversation with an admissions rep. Those applications are reviewed and the ones that are admitted funnel down to a smaller population group yet. From those, some may deposit at the institution. They may deposit at multiple institutions, which is becoming much more popular. Keep their options open until the uh, perceived May 1st enrollment deadline. Uh, but if they deposit, they've put money on the table, it seems much more likely that that student may be coming down the pike towards your institution, uh, very hopeful. Uh, and it is after the admit phase that we can start talking actual dollars. So that's when financial aid leveraging may come to play much more uh, vividly for the student uniquely. And then after the deposits, you try to encourage the students to actually enroll for the coming semester. And ultimately, those enrollees, although they're the ones that are counted right up until the day, it's the attendees that really drives everything. Uh, who actually showed up at the door at the beginning of the term and was sitting there on census date and hopefully throughout the semester and well beyond. Uh, but those are the ones that we're trying to target and, and the ones that the schools are most focused on, trying to make as many pos as possible join into the attendees group. I also wanted to reference the retention. It's not exactly a funnel, but I carried the word for a parallel. To see those students who do come in as attendees, to have continued academic progression, 
to have it at a rate that allows them to graduate on time, preferably, but also if they are running into struggles at some given point, that conversations are being had with those students about whether or not it's a financial problem that is potentially going to set them aside from being able to continue their education. And if so, can we lay some additional financial incentives? Can we give some additional leverage to those students to help them stay on track, continue to uh, be enrolled with the institution and perpetually head forward towards that ultimate graduation? And for some institutions, there's a strong focus beyond graduation. Can we continue the conversation? about the great time that they had and the successes that they've had because of their education and would they like to give back to additional students in the future. Each of those are also components that schools are considering more and more often now relative to leveraging the aid that they may have available. There's a variety of different types of leveraging approaches. Uh, I've kind of categorized some of them together. I wanted to walk through those categories. Academic Merit Awards, that's kind of the bread and butter starting point for most institutions where they are offering a discount for a particular people group. Now, these get very specialized towards the individual student. What was that individual student's high school GPA? What was their particular class rank or how did they do on standardized test scores? And then usually institutions compile these into clusters of students who all have similar characteristics and offer them similar academic merit scholarships, which are discounts ultimately off what the student has to pay. The standardized test scores has become a particularly uh, sensitive topic of recent years as more and more questions have been raised as to the value of the standardized test scores as well as uh, the availability of testing during the COVID's height of its period, where a lot of in-person testing options just weren't available. And so there were more and more schools that were opening up the door for test optional uh, admission into the university. We might have your high school GPA and or your class rank, but even though we normally look for an SAT or an ACT score, uh, giving the student an option to pass on that and have their academic merit awards calculated strictly off of the other criteria that the school might have available. Uh, that was a direction that we opened up at Abilene Christian University uh, two years ago. And I was curious how many other institutions may have opened that same door. Did several of you do the same thing, offering a test optional factor for your students? And if so, how did that play out? I'll just speak to Angelo State. We, um, you know, do have a test optional admission as well as within our scholarship um, consideration um, of, of that merit scholarship that a student would get based on admissions um, provided a way for a student to receive a scholarship without a test score. Um, what we found the first year we did that, which I guess would be fall of 20, um, we awarded a lot more merit scholarships at the lower level um, because, you know, um, you know, without having that test score as a variable, leaning more on the class rank and uh, and the GPA, um, we had more students qualify for a scholarship. So that resulted in uh, adjusting a little bit um, the criteria in the next year um, because of just availability of funds um, in that merit scholarship area, uh, as well as uh, looking at um, the performance of those students. Um, again, seeing some differences of those students who did qualify, um, maybe with, um, you know, that who normally wouldn't have qualified, you know, um, seeing, you know, in some way a difference in their uh, performance as a whole, as a group in renewing their scholarships and what they're doing is success. So all those variables, you know, have been at play. Um, but, you know, I think the reality is, you know, with the test optional admission, um, there still needs to be a way to evaluate a student for 
uh, uh, some type of merit scholarship if the school has that type of program without that score, but finding what is right to really recognize those students who um, meet whatever the expected um, outcome of that type of student coming to the institution, I think is something that, um, you know, uh, the rules have changed for us, I guess I would say. And and again, not that mm. um, I wouldn't disagree that that test score um, often is, you know, potentially biased and, um, you know, knock students out of potential uh, consideration um, of that student being the type of student that we're looking for. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, it just is kind of changing things a lot, uh, especially I think for, again, um, uh, what I would say a regional public university, you know, again, versus a prestigious, um, rigorous uh, um, uh, institution that admits very few students, and they have a whole lot more information that they're using to make the decisions of who they would invite to their institution. And I think that's where that's where I think a lot of the focus has been nationally, you know, is what that means. But what does that mean for um, you know, a, a, a regional public university in, in evaluating who are the students who uh, can come and be successful and then who are the students who, um, for whatever reason, we want to recognize um, uh, with, with some type of scholarship um, that isn't based on, on this need criteria, a need blind consideration because of all the things that you mentioned as to the desired characteristics um, for the institution. So um, it, it, I like it like with, uh, you know, if it's a sporting event and they've changed the rules a bit, the three point line in basketball and changing that all of a sudden that changes the game. And we're, I think we're in, we're in a, in a time where um, we're adjusting. How do we, you know, how, how do we uh, play the game to, to um, have the success we want to have when, you know, now there's a three-point line where there didn't used to be. And I'm, I'm um, somewhat aging myself there, remembering when there wasn't a three-point line and when there wasn't a 24-second clock uh, in basketball. But uh, the game is very different now because of those variables. I think in many ways, that's a beautiful correlation uh, of our normal daily lives teaming with the recruitment uh, staff and playing an aggressive basketball game that's always just back and forth and back and forth. Um, I know some of our uh, some of our admissions team, uh, they always want to play the rules towards the advantage of the student, which I respect. And I tend to do that with rules myself as much as I can to try and open doors for students to qualify for as much as possible to help them be successful and come to school. But the number of conversations I heard about when we started offering the test optional, where the student had actually taken a test, had submitted the score, but the score wasn't as favorable as the school's formula for determining how to give a student an academic merit award if they were without a test score, if they did choose to do test optional. And those conversations would go down the path of saying, hey, student, um, we understand you gave us a test score and that's great, but you also have the choice of us just looking at your GPA if you want. And that could be helpful for you. And with a affirmation from the student, they would just not calculate the test score that was sitting ahead of us. And the student sometimes got a bump up in their academic merit scholarship just because of the ratios that we were using for the test optional calculations. So it did change the conversations. It changed the game to some degree, just opening up a completely new variable uh, for us. We've had to tweak the way that we do our calculations if they do go test optional since we started, which was about the same time frame there for fall of 20, uh, trying to hone it down to what would be most balanced and most normal so that whether they are test optional or do supply a test, they tend to land at the same academic merit award. Uh, and that's, that's taken a lot of numbers over the last couple of years and trying to figure out what the trends are. 
But starting two years ago, when we opened that door, we had no trends. Mm -hmm. So we really didn't have the data as readily ahead of us as we needed to be able to make such a decision. Did any of the rest of you? Yes, go ahead. There's uh, several hands that are up. Um, Let's start with Shauna. Great. Um, I just, I had a couple of comments I wanted to make from the, the test optional factor from the K-12 perspective. We've talked a, a lot about this because we really feel like for some of our students who are high achievers and hard workers, but maybe you're not the best test takers, this has been a game changer for them. Um mm. So, and, and, and we we definitely like it for a lot of reasons, um, but also from the K-12 perspective, we've, we've indicated the challenge that as more schools are advertising their test optional, um, we, have a, we have an accountability feature for students who took Algebra 1 in, or English 1 in middle school that they have to take a, a test in high school. For, and so SAT or ACT are those tests that they've set aside and said, hey, you have to take these um, so that it counts towards the high school's accountability because we don't get credit for what you did in the middle school. And um, so more, it, it's been difficult to try to convince our students with the test optional. That's not to say we want y'all to get rid of the test optional, but just hoping that TEA starts recognizing that as more schools start doing that, um, to maybe change the way that accountability is factored for, for high school campuses. Rochelle? Makes very good sense. Yeah, we we are obviously test optional and we'll be uh, that way the next year. Um, I think our biggest concern going into this was um, how do we, um, because of the different ways high schools have calculate GPAs, um, you know, smaller schools, the, the ranking of students, if you have a smaller population is just overall different. Your students are different. So I think for us, it was just managing that as a whole to try to get everyone on this somewhat same playing field as far as GPA or rank. Um, That was a difficulty that we had, um, but we we managed to get through it. It's odd that you bring this up because we are using a consulting firm to actually help us leverage some of that aid. Um, I will say, say, um, I was pleasantly surprised when it actually did increase our freshman population. Uh, You know, we met our goal and it it increased. Um, What what I think our bigger challenge is, is like you said, going forward, um, trying to maintain those students because we have the same issue um, that that Thomas had mentioned. If a student does take a test um, and it doesn't play to their advantage, How do you treat that student then? Um, We in our office try to not get into that conversation, but we know that that is something that has happened. You know, a a test score, they're not a good test taker um, or or vice versa. So that's something that we we try not to get involved in because most of the time, again, that's that's awarded through the admissions enrollment enrollment side. So um, I've seen it go both ways, but ultimately it was for us the, the learning curve just getting every student on the same playing field because of the the drastic differences in gpas and in and, and ranking uh, was was a struggle for us but we, we we worked through that and we've changed it over the last two years as well so you know each year we have a little bit more data to review to say oh this is how we need to change this so Gilbert? Yeah, I was just curious, just based on uh, Thomas's comment uh, related to their policy, how, I mean, it's been two years, so, so, and many colleges, in fact, in fact, I think the Tribune ran an article, the majority of Texas colleges are opting to continue the, the, uh, I guess, to not require the SAT or ACT uh, into 2023. So over that time, I'm just curious, how has that impacted retention and enrollment? Because it, it looked to me like the statewide data, enrollment is flatter down, um, but there should be data on persistence and retention. Um, 
I know MIT has restored the their SAT and ACT requirements. I recall the commissioner at, at uh, the House Public Ed, uh, Commissioner Morath, referencing you know thirty years of data on the the predictive value of the SAT or ACT uh, in terms of academic outcomes and completion. So I'm just curious how this is playing out uh, and whether, I mean, I get that it's not the only thing, but it can be, you know, uh, it can be an important thing. So I'm just curious uh, what this is looking uh, like across institutions. Now, one of the things that we run into at ACU uh, on point with this is that we did take a peek uh, this past year at those students who went test optional back in fall of 20, and we compared their high school GPAs with those other students' high school GPAs who did give us test scores and tried to look at persistence relative to that. And I mean, it's just one year's worth, so it's not trend data, it's not, you know, uh, probably statistically significant yet, uh, just because of the sample size. But we did see a leaning towards the fact that we were having more trouble retaining students who went test optional when compared with their peers who had similar high school GPAs. Now, maybe that's because they went test optional because testing isn't their thing and it's a struggle. But maybe that was also a little bit of a factor with their success rate in college. So uh, I think that it it helped us to start pondering if indeed those standardized test scores um, had some meaning relative to the interpretation of how likely the student was going to be successful. And when we first went test optional, we were we were tracking down the path of well, we're not so sure that they really are because sometimes they are they do feel a little biased. Sometimes they don't really reflect how strong the student is. Uh, but just with an initial glance, it at least made us uh, second you know, go back to reconsider whether or not the SAT and ACT do directly give a measurement of likely success, because it was making us feel like perhaps they give us one more one more indicator into that very complex question. Yeah, it's it's an interesting challenge because I mean here we are trying to improve the rate of, of credential attainment under the, the Talent Strong Texas and, you know, trying to catch up on, on 60 by 30 goals. But, you know, we're also dealing with the challenge of the pandemic over these two years and you got to get them enrolled. So removing barriers to enrollment is a good thing, but what's the impact on retention, persistence and completion? Could I just add something really quickly? Please. Um, one thing that I that I'm thinking about right now is, um, I would I'm going to make an assumption here. I I obviously don't know the data on this, but right, students who are testing and test well, most likely may have the type of resources to prepare for those tests, right? And so students who are say low SES backgrounds may not have that type of resources or capital to really prepare for those exams. So they probably won't take them. And then when you're considering that and how that impacts student experiences in colleges and persistence and whatnot, when we're thinking about financial hardships, balancing, say, part-time work or full-time work on top of their, their course load or whatnot, I think it, it's we just have to be, I guess, wary or acknowledge the fact that when we're looking at those types of trends, I'm going to make an assumption here that where the students who test, they're, they're graduating or they're persisting at higher rates. Well, maybe that's also because of the type of support and resources that they have that other students from low SES backgrounds do not have that help with their persistence. So I just think that's something to consider when we're talking about certain trends is to understand that um, the type of resources and, and 
support not only before in regards to testing, but throughout um, their undergraduate experiences definitely has an impact uh, in terms of students to the ability to persist in their education, given that pandemic or not, but obviously it's been um, exacerbated, right? But many students from low SES backgrounds are balancing jobs, familial responsibilities and other things like that. And they may not have that type of family contribution that would help them um, maybe balance or focus more on their education. So I understand the, the trends that y'all are seeing and I'm definitely not trying to dispute that, but to understand that there might be more to the story and thinking about how um, access to financial capital and familial support plays an impact on not only their ability to test and test well um, into you know these optional test optional exams, um, but also in regards to the support that they're receiving um, in their undergraduate experiences. Now, I would agree wholeheartedly that the more that we dig into this, the more I keep finding out that we're just barely seeing the tip of this large iceberg. <laughs> it is so hard to, uh, to assess, at, particularly at an individual student level. Um, you, you might be able to get some trend feel for larger groups, but for an individual student, there are just so many factors that lead towards their potential for success and their likelihood for success and their determination for success uh, that can influence uh, both their outcomes of high school as well as coming in and then being successful in college. Absolutely true. Let me go back to uh, share entire screen. Come in. There we go. A couple of the um, academic merit awards that are common, uh, just to add to the list, the National Merit Recognition and other similar programs uh, where a student has done well in testing for a particular uh, national event as well as uh, recognizing accomplishments where they hit particular achievements in high school, like valedictorian awards, salutatorian awards. There are a number of others. Uh, there's also a lot of performance-based awards. Um, student is contributing towards part of the environment, part of the culture of the university or the college that they are at. And so if they're athletically inclined or have any of these uh, giftednesses that are shown here, as well as others, then the university might recognize that and pay towards that because it makes a difference in the culture of the school. And so it's kind of a, a payment for performance, if you will. Uh, there's a lot of specialty awards that are out there, uh, particular enrollment niches that the university wants to expand on, uh, geographic references, whether it be states, counties, uh, you might have a territory where uh, one or two uh, admissions reps are struggling to uh, improve their yield of students, moving them forward to becoming enrollees. And so you might add some additional funding there. There are some universities that might look at or consider ways that, uh, whether directly or more often indirectly, might contribute to be more attractive financially to help uh, raise the numbers that they might have for different groups as in gender or ethnicity, university heritage with alumni awards uh, that might be out there trying to help second and third generation students come to your school. And also I wanted to include the VA yellow ribbon program for private schools as an agreement that uh, if the VA doesn't cover everything that the student has as charges, the university will cover an additional 50% of whatever's left. And that is directly a means of leveraging to try to get more veteran students uh, to be able to come to your university. So those are just examples of different specialty awards that are out there and lingering. Housing is another one that I find very intriguing with the financial aid leveraging concept. There are some discount rate calculations that completely ignore housing because they only focus the discount rate that the university is giving based on their tuition and direct charges. So housing is one where a university can basically offer a decrease in the charge for housing, and in some cases, and or board, um, 
it becomes somewhat invisible in some measures relative to their overall discount, uh, but it is a secondary way to help the students not just come to school, but also come and be at school. And to me, there's a lot of power in that for a lot of students who are living on campus, they help form the campus community a little stronger than those who are commuters at schools that have the residential campus experience. They also have a lot more interaction with their peers than if they're just commuting. And some of that interaction can be really strong incentives for helping with retaining that student. Uh, they want to stay with their peer group. They want to excel with them. They have friends that are constantly you know, encouraging them, hey, let's do this. Let's, let's accomplish this. Let's fulfill this. Don't forget that test on Tuesday. And it can be a, a good way to assist a student in paying for school um, while at the same time doing it in a different way than addressing the aid that would be for the direct costs up front. Um, there's also some perception issues relative to leveraging. Now, it's hoped that whatever leveraging is done is going to be perceived well, received well, and uh, let everybody who's involved in the process from start to finish, from giver to receiver, to feel like, hey, this is all a really great thing, and uh, we're all helping each other in very positive ways. The marketing of that sometimes can make or break the conversation. Um, at one of my prior institutions, we advertised very strongly that 100% of our students received some sort of academic merit scholarship. And our awards ranged from a low end of roughly $10,000 to a high end that was closer to about $25,000 per year of a discount, um, which was very helpful for our costs were pretty high. But I was talking to a parent at one new student orientation day, and he was asking about his son's academic merit scholarship, which was for about $18,000 a year. And he said, OK, the admissions counselor told me that our scholarship is worth 18000 a year. I said, OK, yeah, that's great. He said, yeah, that's nice. But really, it's not. Really, it's only worth 8000 a year. Because you guys give everybody 10000 So you're really only discounting us eight. And I did not have a valid argument to his point. And it's something that sparked a conversation on campus as to whether we should have some category of student that we don't offer an academic merit scholarship to at all. Uh, if they're just barely getting in the door academically, but they're just desperate to be at the school or, or for whatever reason, we wondered if it would make more sense for that marketing aspect right there so that people would really feel like when we're giving them a $20,000 award that we're giving them a $20,000 award, as opposed to the parents who are noting, wait, I'm just getting a difference, and the difference is not nearly as big as what some other schools are getting. was kind of curious if any of you had had any sort of a conversation with a family that went down that similar path, if they, particularly if they're doing, you know, uh, XYZ College offered me this, what are you offering me? Hey, Thomas, it's Millette at UT Southwestern. Um, we had, <laughs> this is one of my favorite things that's happened since I've worked here. Um, but it was, again, sort of something you hear and then, and you immediately go, that's not right. But, but it's really hard to articulate why that's not right. <laughs> um, is we, we had a student who um, received a thousand dollar scholarship, um, which enabled, he was from out of state. So that enabled him to pay the in-state tuition rate. Um, yeah. Over the course of the 12 months, his first 12 months of medical school, he became a Texas resident. And so he uh, purchased property and, you know, whatever. So anyway, our registrar said, okay, now you're a Texas resident. So he came to us and wanted to know where his $13,000 was. And I said, well, I'm confused. What $13,000? And he said, well, that's the scholarship you gave me last year because $13,000 is the difference between in-state and out-of-state tuition. 
Mm-hmm. And so he wanted us to, he said, you were spending $13,000 on me. And so you're still going to spend $13,000 on me, right? Um, so we, we had to step back a little bit. That caused us to rethink some of our marketing materials, some of our materials that talk about, you know, what that waiver to pay the in-state rate means um, and and who's eligible for it. And, you know, and it, it caused us to really have to go back to the to the drawing board a little bit. We'd never had that question before. So um, that kid gets an award for creativity. But we were um, we were sort of flummoxed for a minute. You know, just like, uh you're right, but not right. Like I can't do that, but here's why. So uh, it just reminded me of that. I can see that one playing straight out. We got surprised at one prior school um, because our, our overall concept of offering discounts was perceived as a negative by a large cluster of Chinese families that were looking at our school. And apparently we were told it was a cultural thing for that group and not necessarily all from China by any means, but by the group that we were trying to recruit with the cost of your school being high is a bragging right point. And so as soon as we started talking discount to make it more affordable, affordable for you, that conversation went right in the wrong direction. And it, it made us have to stop, think, try again, you know, reformat this conversation because we're trying to, throughout this process of leveraging or not, we're trying to maximize those conversations and help families and students make good enrollment decisions that also correlate with the goals that the university has. And we were discovering through that little surprise that, whoa, okay, many families, you give them a discount, that's a great thing. Thank you. Some families, that's not the case. And the idea of that not being the case was a new concept for our particular university at that time. We we had taken an assumption that was uh, surprisingly to us invalid that if we offer a discount that will always be perceived as a really great thing and will help move numbers forward. So it, it broadened the uh, set of perspectives that we felt like we had to walk into with when we had conversations about our discount policies. So just a very different approach than any of us had thought anybody would take. I will tell you, Thomas, that is extremely common with medical schools. So we mm-hmm. run into a lot, I mean, a lot of students who talk to us about how low cost UT Southwestern is. It's one of the lowest cost medical schools in the country. And we we struggle against, you know, we want to tell that story. Yes, it's very low cost. Come here. You can get great education for lower than, you know, at this school or that school. And but at the same time, we have to balance that with, you know, why why is it so cheap? <laughs> You know, I think about it being in the grocery store. Why is this cheaper than that one? Is it because it's not as good? (laughs) Is that why? Because that's that happens. Right. Or is there something else going on? And so we try to, you know, when we have those comments, we try to sort of go into, you know, what happens with formula funding and how we, you know, the state supports this effort. And that's why we can, you know, so it it, it gets complex really fast. Um, but that is a common thing that we see um, in medical school recruitment when we're, we're, when we're competing outside Texas. So. Okay. Interesting. Do any of the rest of you run into that same sort of problem? Okay. Let me dive back in. Timing of awards can also be very important. It's believed by a lot of admissions teams that the earlier you can get the money out to Uh, the students 
as far as letting them know about their awards after they've been admitted, the better. Uh, trying to capture the student early in their decision-making process as to where they're going to be attending the school. Uh, if you can get them hooked early, it helps to uh, promote the yield of that student later on so that they aren't considering too many other uh, institutions in their, in their circle and in their considerations. So there's a lot of uh, push to try to get awards out early. Uh, there's also a lot of pushes for mid-cycle nudges. That's where a lot of, at ACU at least, and my last institution, the housing uh, grants come into consideration kind of mid-cycle. It's like, okay, you've got our awards. You're thinking about it seriously. You're kind of on the fence, leaning one way or the other. If you just had a little bit more that could nudge you over, then you would be confident that you would be there. And so we might be looking at uh, small awards that might help nudge them in the right direction towards choosing their institution. There's also last second awards that sometimes are requested by uh, the enrollment teams at some of my prior schools in particular, where, okay, we just haven't met our enrollment numbers, so let's take a lot of money, throw it out there really fast, and hope that we catch some people that are still indecisive at the last minute. And we had a consultant on campus one day that uh, caught a lot of people's attention with his perspective of those last second decisions, because he was a real advocate that choosing a college is a very big decision. It shouldn't be done uh, briskly or flippantly. It should be done through a lot of thought processes for the student, the family, to make sure it's the right pick. And he felt that those last second awards uh, were very particularly well designed for those students who happen to be driving down the road in front of your school, have their car break down, and you want to recruit them to take classes while they're waiting for their tow truck to come and tow them away. He said it's just not productive with that. And most of the most of the looks that we've taken at the students that we've given at each of my prior schools, last second sort of awards, uh, the yields just aren't justifiable for the impression that that dropping of instant money tends to have. So it's one that we, uh, at least at ACU, we've been trying to shy away from. They make our initial offers and you know maybe a few mid-cycle nudges, but that's it. If you're in that last second and still not deciding on whether or not it's the right school, we don't we don't normally feel that it's a money decision as much as it's just a fit or otherwise decision. And so we tend not to use those last second awards, but sometimes there's a lot of pressure uh, from our admission peers to want to do just, just a little bit more. And I can get this one across the finish line, I'm sure. Um, I suspect several of you have had similar conversations over the years with your teams. There's also a factor relative to renewal of awards, and I've been hearing more and more questions regarding this lately. Um, many awards that are given by uh, institutions tend to come with a GPA requirement attached and or a total number of hours achieved per year attached, particularly to help keep the student uh, on track for an on-time graduation status. Uh, one of the things that I've seen, though, is the students often do not have an opportunity after their freshman year to change the awards that they are getting. One of the things that I did when I was the director up at uh, Southwestern Oklahoma State was to restructure our academic scholarships that we offered. We, instead of offering a four-year guaranteed award, we shifted to a one-year guarantee with renewal possibilities. But the renewal possibilities flexed both up and down based on the student's academic performance. We actually built it out so that uh, after your first year, your freshman year, uh, your academic scholarship for the next year would be calculated based 50% on your cumulative GPA and 50% on your most recent year GPA. Now, for a freshman, those are one and the same, generally speaking. But for a sophomore, that means that if you didn't do so well your first year, if you crank it up your second year, you can actually improve the amount of money that we would be giving you. 
students perceived it as a pay for actual performance and it was extremely well received. And we did start to see our overall GPA start to nudge forward in a very positive way. Uh, I was curious if any of you have options where students can improve the amount of aid that they are receiving as they're going through school, or is it just pretty much the one and done? And if so, do you have do you have GPA requirements that they have to meet that are higher than just base SAP? And I admit that was unfair. I asked two questions in the middle of one question. So pick one of them that you want to answer and go for there. I, this is Ed, and I think. Hey, Ed. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I mean, with all of this conversation, is there such variation? And it all kind of depends on what is it you're trying to achieve and, you know, and all of that. And so, um, uh, you know, um, I have worked places where there is something, hey, if your GPA improves at this level, there might be a added amount that you can receive. Um, mm -hmm. At Angelo State, we have what we call an earn in. So if you don't get a scholarship coming in, if you achieve a certain GPA, you'll earn a scholarship in your second year and be able to renew it for third and fourth year, um, which, you know, I think is is a very nice thing in the sense that it does give that incentive for a student who, you know, maybe didn't perform well in high school, again, didn't test well, had a bad year in school, whatever, to, you know, to, to earn something, um, uh, you know, so those are all, you know, at play, but it all really, you know, there's such tensions there because, you know, in some cases, again, looking at statistics, you're counting on the student not renewing their scholarship because, you know, I mean, you know, and there's, you know, again, if you've done the research of what percentage of students at every level is going to renew, if especially if you're tracking your money that you have available to make new awards. On the other hand, you know, there's this perception and, and, and again, the idea of keep the standards low because you want to make that commitment for all four years for the student, you know, regardless of have they outperformed or underperformed? So there's all of those different variables and every school I think has to consider what, you know, what works right for what you're trying to achieve as an institution. Um, and then there's so many variables of, are you managing money? Are you trying to improve performance of students? Are you trying to import for retention? So there's, there's so many things that go into that. Um, but, uh, you know, but, but, and, and, you know, and, and you're dealing there with what is the reality, too, of, you know, the, the you know, are students going to continue to um, retain at your institution even if they lose their scholarship versus, mm -hmm. um, you know, is this going to, you know, if there's extra money, is this going to help them retain? I mean, there's there's so many variables that go into deciding what the right thing to get back to the idea of how do we use our funds most effectively to reach, you know, the goals of the institution and, you know, and what are those goals? I think it gets back to that. And that's a, you know, a bigger conversation. Is it to provide access or is it to, you know, only serve the best and the brightest or some mix of that? And I think, you know, it, it's all of those things that schools are trying to achieve in one way or another that leveraging helps you do it. Um, but those are tensions all along the way. Well, for each of our schools, we want it all, right? I think that that is a common theme. Yeah. Uh, it, it was enlightening to me a few years back when I started realizing that there is such a focus now at many institutions where they have to watch the bottom dollar, where they have to make sure that budgets are balancing out, that they are indeed often actually budgeting the student failure rate, as you just referenced. Uh, and that 
that has come up uh, during some of my years working in financial aid as a more challenging conversation point than I thought it would be, where if I've tried to promote a new opportunity to help students with some financing that would help them retain and succeed, that the counterpart to that discussion is, but wait, we've already budgeted for that $180,000 write-off and we really aren't in a position to reduce that to 150,000. So we might not be able to make this idea fly. And so then I have to come back and show the additional revenues we would gain based on the handful of students that we might retain if we did go down this path. And I would only get approvals if I found a balance point, which economically I can understand, but uh, as a student success advocate, I have struggled at times with this whole concept of, wait, you're banking on failure? I'm, I'm not excited about this, even though it exists, even though it happens. I get it. But I'm still striving for that year where it doesn't exist. I'm still striving for that 100% retention. Let's keep every single one that comes in our door moving forward and help them be successful in result. And so I, I guess I have to remind myself at times to uh, come off that little bit of a high ladder where I'm <laughs> wanting all of our students to land and uh, recognize the reality perceptives that uh, some of my peers are coming to the discussion with, especially those who have more accounting responsibilities than I do. But I want all of my students to be successful. <laughs> that, is a, that is an ongoing challenge with that part of the conversation. couple of additional concepts I just wanted to share with you all. With the net results, you know, we do want it to be uh, helping us meet our enrollment plans at the schools. We do want to meet the budget expectations in all directions. Uh, we also want our recruitment teams to be perceived as advocates where they can speak towards the idea of additional funds, where they can talk to students about different angles that they can apply for or things they can pursue for additional monies to help them be able to pay for school. We want all that. Um, and we also want to help make the composition of the university look like the way that the administration wants. But we can also run into problems with uh, leveraging particular people groups where it does contribute towards the inflating of the college base cost. Uh, I know for our incoming class at ACU right now, our average discount is over 58%, which kind of begs the question of, is our base cost in any way reflective of what our education actually costs students? And in general, it's not. But it is what our base cost is. And I know that there's a lot of students who just look at base costs when they're reviewing schools and initially write off a lot of different institutions as possible just because, wow, I can never afford that. Um, so I don't know that we're giving as clear of a story to families as to what the overall costs are if they just see the sticker price, uh, to use that phrase, instead of the overall picture. And there are great tools that are out there, you know, like the use of net price calculators and such to help students get a better perspective of directly comparing in result prices. But for those that are just looking at the surface, they might be writing off institutions that could be a good fit for them, or they might be getting discouraged about attending college at all. If the first three schools that they look at, they just decide, wow, I could never I can never really afford this, should I even be thinking about it? And that too is a direction that I would love to see students not have to go down, but to be instead encouraged about the prospect that yes, there are ways to make college work, I can afford it, we can make this happen. Uh, it also, the discounting processes really can make a very rash difference in the amount of money that individual students sitting in the same classroom are having to pay for the same educational experience. And so there's some questions that pop up about equity relative to that. Some of the questions that I've been pondering uh, relative to the discounting efforts that uh, we do at each of the schools uh, are listed here just, just 
as a review of some of the things that we've been pondering. Uh, the fifth and sixth year awards, whether those should be automatically continued or if there should be an appeal required if the student doesn't graduate in four, especially for institutions that offer four-year scholarships as their uh, marketing up front. That's one that I've heard several schools asking about in recent months as to what their practices are. And it's also one that we are pondering what our practice should be at Abilene Christian. And that was kind of the question that I wanted to summarize with, with each of you, just to get a better feel for what approach that you may be taking with that. Uh, at Abilene Christian, we offer four-year awards. And if you don't graduate at the end of four, then we do take away your scholarship for your fifth year and beyond. We offer an option for appeals, but ultimately only about a third of our students who make it through four years and have not yet graduated, only about a third of them are going through the appeal process. And most have justifiable reasons, you know, changed my major three times, finally I'm on track, Here, here's where I need to be, you know, family life situation rocked our world for a while and now I'm back and need to finish or I'm not really back, but I still really need to finish. And uh, so we, we tend to lean towards approving most of those appeals. Uh, but the questions that have come up for us is, is it worth our administrative time to be reviewing those or would it be just quicker and easier to just let it be a standard that if you're going to stay for a fifth year, we get it, things happen. We'll let you have that one more year of, of, of aid. Um, so that's an area that we're struggling with at ACU. And I've talked to at least three other schools in the last couple of months who have been calling around asking, what do you guys do? What do you guys do? Because this fifth year concept is becoming more and more the norm for a lot of students. And I was curious of you all. What approaches do you take when a student has worn out the time period of their award? Um, do you continue to offer it or do you force an appeal situation? Victoria? Thomas, um, at TCU, we do limit students um, eight to four years for both academic as well as institutional aid. And you have an access after the fourth year. For the most part, if a student has financial need, I will replace some of those funds with need-based aid to assist the students in completion. But we do go back and kind of observe, you know, has the student been doing their part or have they failed all their courses through the four years? Um, and we take that into consideration in terms of um, helping students with financial need. Okay, that's very helpful. That's very good. How big of a group do you have review those? I'm curious. All of our advisors will review uh, appeals. So we have we have four advisors. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. Are there other approaches that some of you take when the student crosses that fourth year line? Yeah, for us, we're running numbers currently uh, trying to compare the retention rates that we've had. Uh, some have argued, well, they're so close to graduating, they're not likely to go anywhere else because they'd have to add a year or more if they transferred, whereas if they just stayed and paid it, they can get done one, maybe two semesters. But uh, we have not yet pulled enough information to feel with confidence how that's looking because we're having to segment out those students who did appeal from those who didn't. We're going to have to segment out those that we approved their appeals and those who didn't. There have been some that we've turned down appeals and yet they did stay. They did finish out. Um, pretty good handful of those who we turned down their appeals and they did not. So they ended up going somewhere else and you know, we're not sure how long that drug out their educational experience, or if it did conclude positively, like we would have preferred. So it's an area that we're still struggling with on campus ourselves. And, uh, there's just, once again, it just keeps circling back around. There's just so many factors. 
know, I appreciated the fact that you referenced, you know, we take a look and see, did they fail all their classes or not? You know, are they really trying? Which I think uh, for a lot of our hearts, that's probably where the answer ultimately lies. Are they trying? And if they're trying, we're going to try to to do something to help them be successful. But at a certain point, if you find they're not trying, then yeah, it does feel like there's less incentive, less likelihood of a success, uh, less reason to go out of our way to try to make a very positive difference if they're not trying to do their part. But boy, for those students who are, uh, it does seem to be a common spirit for each of us to try to want to make sure that things land well for them if we can. Um, I appreciated the uh, the concepts and the questions that were raised, and I hope that the overall discussion was helpful um, for some of you that are here and others who might look at the uh, broadcast after it's available later. So, Victoria, thanks for the discussion. Question or comment? Oh, I your hand was yes. Up. Sorry, I missed one. Gilbert, I thought uh, your hand was up as well. Yeah, I, I actually just had a question related to the. I think Thomas, you you mentioned you have. Uh, you've tried out sort of last chance aid awards targeted to students that maybe haven't made a, a commitment. Um, and I'm curious about, I think I heard you say that that was not very effective in actually encouraging enrollment. And I, I think contextually, I'm just trying to wrap my head around that because we've got a large uh, summer melt effort that we do in partnership with our school districts. And it it targets, you know, a couple thousand students. And what we found is when they run into an aid award gap, uh, that sometimes these small commitments or changes in financial aid awards do actually get them to enroll. So it's just curious, are you targeting students that sort of reach out to you about these aid gaps? Or are you, or were those targeted to students that maybe hadn't made a commitment, but that you all found desirable and were trying to, to kind of get them to commit? No, great question. Great question. The amount of um, personal touch uh, that our private institution does reaching out to students throughout the whole cycle, um, most of our students realistically have made their decision by the time that we would consider that we've hit the midpoint of our recruitment cycle, if you would. So like April, um, leading up to the perceived May 1st deadline, which for a lot of schools, May 1st isn't really a deadline for anything, but uh, with our population group that we work with, uh, there's kind of an underlying perception that, yeah, by May 1st, May 1st, that's a magic date, May 1st, I got to make my decision. So all of the discussions that we have and, and money that we might offer to students leading up to that date, which we consider mid-cycle, it, it's effective, it's meaningful, because the mindset of our particular population group tends to lean towards that's a date I have to make a decision by. And so for us, it's after that date, if we offer incremental awards to different students uh, or even larger awards for different students, um, we just don't tend to see a lot of traction on that. And I think it might be because most of the students that we're working with already had that preconceived notion that I had to do something by May 1st. And even if I haven't done it by then, well, I really need to have my leaning one way or the other within a couple of weeks, not so much in June or July. Now, at other schools, June or July might be the bread and butter time. So it does vary drastically, I suspect, by population groups. And it sounds like yours, you have more success than probably I've been able to see at my last two institutions in being able to help those students uh, make that final nudge more deep into the summer. Is that what I was hearing, that you had a, you've had some success with that? Yeah, uh, particularly with lower income and first generation students. OK. Oh, that's great. That's great. Uh, so much of this is balancing out not just the school's wants, but who the students are that we're talking to. And really, the effectiveness of financial aid leveraging programs depends on their needs, not ours. How are we meeting them where they're at? How are we making a difference from their perspective on their decision making, as opposed to any goals or wants that we might have at our school level? So I'm happy to hear that uh, 
for some, those later awards do matter. Uh, it's just been a few years since I've seen it with the population groups, for whatever reason that I've been dealing with at ACU, as well as my last private school back in Indiana. Thank you. Certainly. Well, thank you all. I appreciate the conversation and the ideas that you put out there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thomas. Um, you know, we've had a reoccurring theme throughout this meeting today, and um, it goes back to retention and recruitment and um, how each school's doing. And our last topic, we want to make it really brief because we're closing in on our time. Um, just talk a little bit about some ways to address some roadblocks. Um, Gilbert had, had mentioned that um, the students that they deal with, sometimes that last minute push will um, tip them over the edge and get them to go ahead and enroll. Um, I think all of us collectively, whatever kind of institution we're at or whatever um, situation we're in, um, Shauna at the ISD or uh, even Jace as a student, we're looking at the population as a whole and trying to holistically um, help our students to be able to achieve their goals, um, which also are our goals because our, de our funding depends on retention and graduation rates and, um, and whether that's private or public, whether wherever your funding is coming from, your, your graduation rates mean that that student stayed with you for a long time at, to the point of completion. And so, and it looks better whether you're private or public to say, oh, our graduation rate is 90% or 75% versus, oh, our graduation rate is hmm, started from that. Okay. So we all have these goals that we are working toward, uh, but we also have roadblocks that we uh, incur. Some of the roadblocks that I'm thinking about off the top of my head um, is, simply the reduced student population um are is there really a uh, a crisis in our uh, population are we um to the point where we don't have enough students to actually support the amount of institutions that we have i mean is enrollment um is enrollment down because we don't have the students there to recruit or is enrollment down because the students that we're recruiting are not coming to school. Um, so it's, we're, you know, there's some things that we can look at as an institution. Um, so that brings a question. Do we need to perhaps, uh, the data that T Texas uh, on course can provide for us, can we look at this, this data and can we see the pathways these students are, are wanting to go down? Can we see who's filling out the FAFSA and TASFA and where we can bridge that gap? Do we need task forces? Do we need committees at our institutional level to be able to study this data? And or do our institutional research offices look at this data and say, how can we improve and how can we reach um, the students that are there? to bring them in and so we can reach our um, our Texas goals with the uh, talent uh, strong and, and the, 30, the 60 by 30. So we can reach our goals that we have as a state, as an institution, um, as an ISD. What to look inward for us. So my challenge to you as we kind of are wrapping up um, our meeting today is to look at challenges in your own institution what are some roadblocks? Um, one of the things in our institution that we're seeing in a decrease in enrollment is our dual credit students are on the rise, which is awesome, but they're not really considered full-time freshmen. They're considered dual credit. So what does that do to our funding level? You know, because we have um, all these dual credit students, which is awesome, because we're reaching that population and then they graduate from high school and they're like, oh, well, we took all our stuff at Panola. So we're going to go on to SFA or UT Tyler or, you know, UT Arlington or wherever. And uh, they're bypassing our community college. So what 
what problems arise for us. And so I think that a different population that we have to focus on, maybe the adult population, you know, maybe that's something, an area we need to move into. Also, what about um, the diversity? Are our admissions uh, processes, our financial aid processes, is, is it open for that student that Jace was mentioning earlier that doesn't, ha- they don't have the, um, the support? Do our processes hinder that support? Um, so it's a lot for all of us to talk about. It is a lot for all of us to take in. And, and I think all of us are, are reaching for the same goal, and that's to educate our students in the best possible way at whatever level we're at, whether we're at IK through 12 or uh, the grad student. So um, great, great conversation today. Great discussion. I appreciate every one of you for um, adding value to our meetings by bringing your opinions and your ideas because it's really, um, this is what we're here for. We're here to share ideas and um, all of the presenters today, thank you so much for um, being here and uh, giving us food for thought. And Thomas, you, the leveraging not only applies to schools that use that method and the methodology there and the leveraging, but it also applies to all of us when we look at the, the generalized terms. So with that in mind, I'm going to ask if there are any other comments about retention and recruiting and uh, leveraging and Texas on course or any of the, uh, the leadership that Matt brought to us this morning, anything that, that you're just dying to say that you haven't been able to say yet. Okay, so I guess everybody has said what they needed to say. Well, at this point in the agenda, um, it's time for a transition. Um, I do want to thank um, the committee for all of your uh, involvement this year. Um, I want to thank Deshay and Jody for um, propping me up most of the time and telling me what to do. Uh, because sometimes I just get a little scatterbrained. So I do appreciate uh, all of you and what you mean to our committee and what you bring to the table uh, from your backgrounds and from your environment and from your institutions. Um, but as as I uh, transition to past president, I would like to enter a past president. Wrong organization. Brass chair. Uh, <laughs> I want to introduce to you uh, your new chair for the coming year, and that's Rochelle Garrett. And at this point, um, I'm supposed to give you some words of wisdom, Rochelle, but I don't have any. <laughs> None? <laughs> what does Shay tells you to do? <laughs> and you'll be great. Uh, but thank you so much, and good luck to you. Thank you, Denise. I appreciate it. I know, I know, I know you're still going to be there to help me through, as well as Deshay and Jody. So. Um, I guess we will move on to the next topic and or that is uh, any feedback that you guys have for future meeting ideas, topics, conversations, discussions. Um, I think I had a few written down previously that we had kind of thrown out at um, some previous meetings, but we really are looking for, um, you know, things that you want to talk about, things that are on the, the forefront. Um, a couple of things that I had, you know, we talked about this earlier, re- any research related to FAFSA completion versus um, enrollment or higher enrollment. So that might be something that we can look at. Uh, as Deshae De- 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 said, that we, we may be able to find a, a presenter on that. Um, I had a topic of graduation rates. I don't know. That's all I had written down. I don't know what that was related to, if graduation rates were up or down. I think, Denise, you and I were talking about that, but I don't remember what. Um, And then another thing that I had, um, this was from probably almost mm, a year ago, maybe early spring, HERF outcomes. 
um, and specifically related to um, did did that help with persistence in enrollment? Um, did that you know wh what was the the outcome uh, with that? Did that help us as institutions? That's just what I had written down. But if you guys have any ideas, anything else that y'all want to talk about, was there anything else, Deshay, that you had 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 that I don't did not have? I know we brought up uh, the student aid index and what that looked like at a state level. So I did have that written down in, from previous meetings. And um, again, going back to some of the conversations we had earlier about trying to pull in certain data to see kind of what that looked like. Um, I did jot some of those things down. So I'll be circling back around with some of the committee members um, and using some of their contacts to see if we can get some presenters in for specific data related topics. If anyone else has any ideas, just let us know. Um, you have our email address, so let us know. Yes. Anything else? Okay, we will um, move to adjournment, but before that, just a quick reminder, do not forget to do your expense reports, please. Those will be coming from Jody. She she emails us that, that I believe, so um, you should be getting those from Jody shortly. Um, let's just fill those out for her, and we will be good. So, uh, do we have a movement to adjourn? I'm so moved. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> enjoy Thank your you. Thank Thank care, in summer. We don't see each other again to September. So enjoy <laughs> any summer plans that you have and uh, or enjoy continuing to work during the summer. Like some of us <laughs> probably will be doing. <laughs> Stay <laughs> hydrated in this heat. <laughs> have a good one, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye-bye.